Good morning, everyone. I think we're going to get started. So take your seats, everyone in the break area, if you can hear me. We're going to get started. Good morning. Hello. Good morning, everyone. I'm sorry to interrupt your wonderful conversations. We are going to get started. And I'm going to go through our housekeeping slides one more time in case you missed it. So to protect the health and safety of everyone, we encourage you to uh, review the full health and safety policy on our event website. Do what you feel comfortable doing. We have masks and COVID tests at the registration desk should you want one. And please respect everyone's decisions. Um, Wi-Fi network and password is also on your tables. Um, and then if you haven't already downloaded it, find the attendee mobile app. You'll be able to use it for a couple more hours. And code of ethics and community conduct, please treat everyone with respect, empathy, consideration, and do not behave negatively. <laughs> um, if you do witness or experience a violation of the code of ethics and community conduct, please contact us at conduct at ga4gh.org. We do questions uh, through Slido, so you can navigate to slide.do on your web browser and type in GA for GH. You can ask questions throughout the talk. You don't have to wait till the end, and we will answer them when we get to them. And also, I will say, any unanswered questions, we keep having tons of questions, which is great. They will all be added to the GA for GH Slack where you will find your answer. And now I will turn it over to Heidi, our chair-elect. Thank you, Angela. So it's a real great pleasure um, for our opening uh, plenary talk this morning to introduce Patrick Sullivan. Uh, Patrick became a passionate childhood ca cancer advocate after he heard the word incurable for the first time in May 2008. His desire to make a change in cancer research is in part an effort to pay an unpayable debt to his son, Finn, and to change the stories of other Finns. By profession, Patrick is a securities and corporate commercial litigator, but he's also the proud father of three remarkable children, Baird, Sarah, and Finn, and would do almost anything for the simple pleasure of holding Finn's hand again. With that, Patrick. Thank you. Um, if we could bring up the slides, please. And I assume this is my button for moving them. Yeah. This, oh, the big green one, got it, okay. Sorry, there are two green buttons. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, uh, I am here today to speak to you about advocacy uh, and the role of advocacy might have in advancing the um, objectives of GA4GH, the Global Alliance. In doing so, I'm going to take the opportunity to tell you about Finn in, in a way that I hope uh, we'll explain later is ties back to why I think advocates can help advance what you're doing. Um, I took the opportunity last night to go through the agenda and these are the various talks taking out the network breaks and all of the rest that you have heard or will hear later today. And the highlighted in yellow that there's, you know, one of these things is not like the other. I'm not a scientist, don't have a scientific background. Um, found science boring in high school, didn't pursue it after high school, and didn't find my love of it again until my daughter was two or three and started asking a bunch of questions that I got curious about. Um, in terms of uh, starting, I want to start with a story of about Finn. You heard a little bit about Finn earlier. This is Finn in June 2008. We are at the BC Cancer Agency. Uh, behind the man on the left is the radiation therapy machine that Finn's about to enter. He's an anesthesiologist because Finn had to be knocked out. This is palliative radiation that we're doing at this point. Uh, Finn was diagnosed with rhabdomyosarcoma in February of 2007. It was a baseball-sized tumor. It's a muscular tumor and it was growing out of his prostate at the time. Uh, we did all of the standard treatments. We had finished all of the protocols. 
when in May 2008 we did hear the word incurable for the first but unfortunately not the last time in my life. Um, you can see the monkeys hanging. Uh, these were something we would bring because Finn had over 70 anesthetics, so we weren't going to a treatment, we were going to the monkey room so that it changed the experience for him. Um, I'm, a, you know, I'm not a light man now, but I was a little heavier at the time because my focus was on other things and comfort food. Um, and if go one forward, this was sort of Finn's existence at the time. The tumor had grown to a point where Finn couldn't sit anymore. You know, when we drove somewhere, he had to lie in the van. Um, this was his little yellow car that he would ride at great speeds. Uh, he couldn't sit on it anymore, so he went around that by learning to push it, and that was still riding his car. Uh, this is in June 2008 on the right, Finn with his older sister Sarah, after they put in the colostomy bag because he was having trouble going to the washroom. Um, so we were in a place where Finn was in a tremendous amount of pain, um, and we had a radiation uh, therapist interventional therapist who was you know, moving heaven and earth to try and find something not curative but treatment oriented. And calling his colleagues across North America to see what might be available. And you know, we explored heat ablation for the tumors um, and that was rejected because it felt it would kill Finn given the size of his tumors. We thought about inducing chemicals into them, but the worry was the pain that would cause. We ended up trying cryotherapy in Spokane. And so we drove down to Spokane, uh, Finn and my wife lying in the back of the van. Um, we had the treatment. We came back the next day. And from that treatment, Finn came back, and he ran again. And he rode his little yellow car again. Right? This is Finn with my wife. Uh, and I remember this day, um, my daughter running around telling everyone, uh, Finn's running, Finn's running, um, and the big, big smile on her face. And then a couple weeks later, this is at Sarah, who's just behind Finn at her sixth birthday party. Um, prior to the party, um, uh, you know, we were doing breakthroughs of methadone with Finn to sort of deal with his pain. He um, was upstairs, but all of his young friends were there, so he came down and came into the kitchen and just started running around our island, and, and all of the other kids started running with him. Right. And I tell you, and I'll tell you why I'm telling you that particular story as we go through my slides, and I'm, I'm going to sort of break from there because um, while that gave us Finn back, it was never intended and was not curative. And um, in October 2008, I found myself in a hospice telling Finn it was okay, he didn't have to do this anymore. And he died shortly after that. So my journey from there has um, been about trying to give some meaning to that meaninglessness of, of what happened before. So part of that, um, these are some of the different things I've been involved in, and, and I haven't put all of them. I've tried to put ones that are sort of relevant to this room. There's Terry Fox Profile, which is a Canadian, pan-Canadian initiative that is sequencing hard-to-treat, refracted, re relapsed pediatric patients, kids like Finn, to give them another opportunity, another chance for hope. Um, I was part of a Stand Up to Cancer grant led by Peter Dirks as an advocate, looking at uh, deeply interrogating on an omics basis brain tumors to see what treatment options might be available and what we could learn about them. Part of a different Stand Up to Cancer St. Baldrick's grant that is now called EPIC, looking at the interplay between uh, genomics and immunotherapy and what could be learned in terms of cell surface molecules for different ways to treat pediatric tumors. Um, I am on the board of directors of the Canadian Cancer Research Alliance, which is not just pediatric oncology, but all oncology organizations in Canada. And I put the nature medicine there because um, I'm a scientifically published author, always somewhere in the middle. Um, uh, this was a paper on uh, uh, data sharing, what, what it should look like, how we should try and do it. 
And I was given a copy of the manuscript. It was already well developed, and, and the manuscript talked about how important it was from a scientific perspective and from a patient perspective. It talked about the importance of privacy and how we need to protect that. And uh, and and I read it and I said, okay, I get all of that. All of that's important, but what I'm not seeing here is how driven patients are to see change, how much we want our data to be used, how we how it's not even. <laughs> I've participated in the studies, it's not even a question of, um, there's an inherent expectation that it's already being done and, and a lack of understanding that there are barriers in place. And so I feel like I earned my spot on the paper by having that part driven into it, that there is a desire to see this happen and to see that change happen and how we can be a real voice for expressing that. Because, quite frankly, when I say that after telling you about Finn, I am going to be heard differently than any of you are going to be heard in conveying that message. And that is not, and I emphasize not, a rejection of the privacy concerns. They are real, they are important. It is just there needs to be a balance from my perspective. So, continuing. So I'm going to move to uh, GA4GH, and I'm hoping by the end of the day I can say that without looking at the sticky note in front of me. <laughs> it is an awkward moniker. <laughs> so, um, I wanted to come back to, to look. So I went to the website. I looked to, to what you guys had talked about, what this was about. about you know, I've, I've known Peter for years. I've known about the Global Alliance for years. I am a big believer in what you're trying to do and the importance of that sharing of information. You know, how much simpler it could be to find solutions. The story that I told you about Finn was a story of a doctor going way out of his way to find us something, right? But that took a doctor going way out of his way to find us something instead of a systematic approach that allowed that to just happen. Right? And that may have happened because of who we were, that may have happened because of who Finn was, that may have happened because of who that doctor was, but it does not happen routinely. Right? And we need these things happening routinely. And that's a role that advocacy can help play. And that's a role that this organization, in my view, sitting from the outside looking in, is critical to playing. So I'm going to skip and come back. What's the backwards button, the red, I assume? Okay, okay. Um, in preparing for this, I um, uh, had some talks with leadership about some of the successes. There's a bunch of videos there. There's some really, really neat things that, that have been accomplished through this organization over time. These are just some of them. There is a rightful reason to be proud of what you have done. Uh, in the same way, there is a rightful reason for that doctor in BC who helped us find that treatment to be proud of what that gift he gave us, but it's not enough, right? It is an excellent, excellent start, but it is not what I'm looking for. Um, I, I'm going to come back. Sorry. I, I'm going to go sideways for a second. Um, this is the uh, logo for King's College, which is a liberal arts university in Halifax, Nova Scotia. My um, Baird, who is 18, is attending for the first year. Uh, you know, loving the program, doing a journalism course combined with a very neat liberal arts program. I talked to her yesterday about um, you know, studying Plato's Republic. They've just finished the Odyssey. She's really enjoying the nerd-like aspect of all of these things that she's doing. Um, she has been looking at her window at the various flags and going on her own mission. So she noticed that the kings, and this is one of them, but there's another one that has four logos in it, or four things, and she wondered, what are all those things in those various corners of this logo? Chased it down, went to the library, was so excited to tell me all about this, had studied the king's flag. I may be one of the only people in the world that could find that interesting and bear talking to me about this, right? You may be some of the only people in the world <laughs> who are interested deeply about this stuff, right? <laughs> this t spoke to me more 
when I went through and saw Mark was speaking and, and sort of went backwards, a, a promise to change the way medicine is practiced. This speaks to me even more, though. This is a young boy named Calvin. He was diagnosed with a sarcoma of the dura, the lining of his brain. It had grown. It's an ex you know, childhood cancers are rare. This is you know, in the rarest of the rare. It had grown and metastasized to such a point that Calvin was bedridden. He was um, seven at the time. He was sequenced uh, as part of the POG program in BC that eventually became part of Profile that I talked about earlier. Uh, as part of that sequencing, he, um, his data was shared uh, into the United States to see if there was some treatment that might be available. They found a drug that no one ever would have thought of that might work. It did. You know, the PET scan, the Christmas tree sort of went away. His tumor shrank. He got to Disneyland, he got back to school, he got another year of life before the cancer came back. But again, that work and that result was because doctors went out of their way to make it happen. It's unusual, it's not a feature, it's a bug in the system. So how do we make it a feature? Finn uh, had rhabdomyosarcoma. sarcoma. These are um, survival curves for patients with relapsed pediatric tumors. You can see with Finn, it's zero if you relapse with rhabdomyosarcoma, right? Um, Finn was given a 70% chance of survival when he was diagnosed in 2007. His treatment regimen was VAC and Christine actinomycin cyclophosphamide. Uh, Finn was diagnosed today. He'd be given a 70% chance of survival. His treatment regime would be been Christine actinomycin and cyclophosphamide. If Finn was diagnosed in 1987, he would have been given a 70% chance of survival. His treatment regime would have been vincristine, actinomycin, and cyclophosphamide. Right? We have moved the deck chairs enough around. We are not going to get better results. It is only through more deeply interrogating the data and sharing that data and making sure it's available that we're going to make change. And we're starting to see that. But we're seeing that at the scientific level, we're not seeing that at the treatment level, and we need to ramp up the speed with which we get that to the treatment level. So we get more of this, right? I don't want this to be a picture that was taken two months before this Finn died. I want this to be a picture taken 15 years ago where I'm talking about Finn being in university as well. So advocacy, how can we help you? So moving to a slightly different topic, I thought this slide was particularly appropriate for this group. We can talk about data, we can sort the data, we can arrange the data, we can present it visually, or someone can tell you a story about the data. Right? That's what advocates can be, are effective storytellers for you. In, in, in an effort to give the message of what you want to achieve, if you bring in advocates more, that is certainly, in the very least, a role they can help play in terms of conveying the importance, helping with the barriers. I'm going to talk sort of loosely about some various advocacy tips. I'm happy to talk about more. Um, advocates can have various roles. I've already told you about telling stories. They can ensure a patient focus. Right. I understand that the currency of science is publications. I don't give a rat's ass about publications, right? I understand it's part of what has to be done. I understand how important it is. I'm not diminishing it, but it is not my focus. My focus is how do we, how do we get better answers for Finn? How do we make sure Calvin gets that treatment earlier and maybe it makes a difference for him? How do we do that systemically? How do we do that systematically? And people like me in rooms like this help make sure that we remember that's what we're there to do, right? All of the data sort of sharing is a strategy, right? How we sh data share is a tactic, but it is not the objective. It is how we get to the objective, right? So we can add a human face, a sense of urgency, uh, can certainly stimulate discussion, give diversity. I think we spur innovation. Um, certainly, we can expand public understanding. 
um, and climb over, break through, get around. We, we want to know what the barriers are and help you get through them. And, and you know, I've heard David Malkin say this before. I've sort of touched on it in a different way. I can say things differently. You can say them in a way. If we say them together, that is not one plus one equaling two. That is an exponentially stronger message if it is integrated, the science and the urgency. Uh, characteristics, right? These are the type of people you, you run into. And, and you'll have to remember that not all advocates are the same. Um, you would not go into a room of scientists and say, hey, I need a scientist for a project. You would say, I need a bioinformatician. I need a clinician. Advocates have different hats and have different roles. I bring with me the fact that I'm a lawyer. My advocacy skills as a lawyer come into the room with me. There are people who are communication specialists. There are people who have a scientific background. Right? Those skill sets, it's not just lived experience. We bring a diversity in the way we think about the world and the way we problem solve that can help. Um, we are altruistic. We, I see sometimes hesitation amongst the community in asking people because they don't want to put a burden on them. It's a gift, right? To the right person, it's a gift. Don't rob them of the gift of participation if that's what they want. Uh, they're thankful. They can become content mini experts. Um, I think I've covered the others. You can involve them anywhere. But again, there's a horses for courses mentality to this. You can involve them anywhere, but you want to involve the right people in the right places at the right time. Right? So it can be anywhere on the spectrum, and that was part of what I was trying to show you earlier. It's my strength tends to be at the advisory board of directors policy setting level. Um, you know, I was on an advocacy call earlier this week where we're trying to determine where we were going forward. And I said, well, if this is the way we're going forward, I completely get that, but I should be backing out because that's not my skill set. You need someone else in this chair. And I think we need to be sort of intentional about thinking about that, right? Um, tokenism, you know, I don't complain about tokenism because it's a start, but, but we can be more intentional if we want to be effective. I think if you can engage advocates, when we're back here in a decade, you're going to see a, a more successes that would not be there without the advocates being heavily engaged in what you're doing. And, and I'll finish with a quote, one of my favorite quotes, and it's from F. Scott Fitzgerald, life is about all, our lives are defined by, by opportunities, even the ones we miss. Not, if you don't have the advocates heavily engaged, you won't even know what opportunities you are missing. If you can figure out a way to do it intentionally across what you're doing, you are going to see opportunities you never realized were there. Uh, and I finished about 10 minutes early. So, I, so I'm happy to take lots of questions. Thank you for sharing that wonderful story. So um, people can add uh, their questions to Slido as usual, but maybe I'll just get us started. You know, a lot of us um, don't have direct connections to patients and advocacy um, because maybe we're a clinical lab and we get the data, but the clinician orders the test and they interact with the patient and they're too busy to engage that patient. Like how, how you know, What's the way to get around the blockers in between in terms of many of us who want to do right by the patients? Like, what is the best way to do that sort of engagement? So, so there, is no, there is no single best way. I think that the first, the, the first answer I would give to, have the, to that question, if you recognize it as a value, and that is going to give you value, that will start to open up opportunities and, and make you realize that there is more than, than you see. So you can ask your clinical colleagues, you know, do you know any patient advocates who might be interested in this? Um, you can look to organizations who might have people sort of involved. You can reach out to you know, find a patient advocate 
and try to get within two or three degrees of separation. Hey, I know I just heard Sullivan speak there. Does he know someone who might know someone who knows someone? Um, I would strongly encourage uh, everyone to make sure their young PIs are being exposed to this, their PhDs, their postdocs, because I think the cultural shift will happen there over time. Right? In one of the teams that I talked about earlier, um, it's got eight different institutions across North America. What we have done in that team is we've paired every advocate with a young investigator. We've done co-presentations together. So, and, and the advocate has presented the science and the scientist has presented the advocacy, right? And, and um, at conferences I've been at, you can see budding between advocates and scientists. So you could reach out to AACR and say, hey, you have this patient survivor program. Do you have anyone with this sort of phenotype? Or can we get engaged? Or can I send my, uh, you know, can I send a, P, you know, a PhD or a postdoc from my lab to attend a conference to learn some of these skills? Great. All right, we have some questions coming in. So the first one, to what extent do advocates connect globally? Do you have experience of global connections? Uh, so I come from a pediatric oncology setting, right, where we connect globally exceedingly well. So um, I, there is a group in the pediatric oncology called Accelerate, which is based out of Europe but has strong ties in North America that brings together uh, pharma, um, clinicians, uh, advocates, and scientists all in this same group where they meet annually and they have separate breakouts. I am part of a Cancer Research UK initiative where we have advocates from the UK, from the United States, from France, and I'm there from Canada. Um, th the reality is the pediatric oncology world is well connected internationally already, so it's probably a natural outbreak of that. Um, but there are all kinds of international consortiums that people are a part of. Uh, you know, I've attended the AACR meeting as a patient advocate. I've attended as a mentor. So yes, there are, they do connect. Uh, not all, but there are, there are in my space certainly, and I've seen it in other spaces as well. Great, thanks. Um, from Tiff, Patrick, thank you so much for sharing Finn's story. Can you speak to strategies for involving advocates in research prioritization and design to avoid tokenism? Yeah, it depends how structural you want to get. I mean, there's the James Lind Alliance, which is sort of the creme de la creme in a priority setting context where they do a very deep dive and get patient engagement and, and um, in a, in a studied scientific way. Um, there is developing literature, and some of which I'm involved in, in terms of how best practices in terms of how to do this. At a very practical level, um, at what, where I have found initially, because this is advanced in terms of how it's been done, there's been a lot of work in this field. So when I initially got involved in the first Stand Up to Cancer team in 2012. Uh, John Maris and Crystal Mako, who were leading that group, invited all of the various PIs to Philadelphia as part of the grant writing process before it was submitted. The advocates were invited. We were in the room. And we had input and questions, and we wrote part of the grant. Right? So, we aren't able to say pick this science versus that science, but if you want to get people involved in the priority setting, you know, we're getting better at inviting them to the table. Let's get advocates in the kitchen, right? Let's get them sort of helping to cook the meal, get them involved earlier. Um, if it, so it's, it can be as formal as priority setting, it can be as simple as get them there when you're trying to figure things out. Great, thanks. Um, the next one, can you talk more about your view on how to balance data privacy and sharing and what we as a community could do better in that regard? So, about five years ago, we started working with Health Canada. And, and so I'm going to tell you a story and come back to the answer uh, because I believe people remember stories versus sort of data. Um, we started working with Health Canada, 
and at the time, or trying to work with them, and, and I remember the first meeting we had in August 2018, there were uh, seven advocates in a room in Health Canada, and it was like a Sadie Hawkins dance. All the advocates were on one side of the room, all the Health Canada, and it was a very, very stilted meeting. But before the meeting, I'd said to our group, our objective here is to get another meeting, right? Build trust, get another meeting, right? And that developed into where we did a, met with the Minister of Health, ended up doing some round tables where we set the ground rules that they were confidential. We brought people in to start talking about how important advancing research was for them because there is conception that embeds itself in a regulatory structure that is natural and that, as it relates to pediatric oncology, that is, well, we've solved that problem. Yeah, cure rates are above 80%. It's one of the success stories of pediatric oncology. And we have to make sure that we're not exposing these kids to crazy shit and we need to protect them, right? And so hearing from the patients, not why the hell are you doing that, not holding pitchforks, but how we are passionate about wanting to see things advance, that's how you do this, right? Where are you running into the hurdles? Where are they from a legislative perspective? Where are they from a regulatory perspective? We can sit all in this room and rail about all of those things, or we can go talk to the people who are doing that, and we can talk to them with advocates in tow, telling about, you know, not, like in a Health Canada context, I'm constantly saying, I get safety, I get efficacy. Those are really, really important objectives, but we also need access. How do we, how do we make that happen? So I get privacy concerns, but how do we make sure that there's data sharing? And what if people are prepared to take the risk? Is it your job to stop them from taking that risk? What does that look like? Because I have a reason for wanting this to happen. And by the way, I participated in this study at BC Children's, and here's what we found. We found that was common across the board. It, it is how do you build the relationships of trust with the decision makers who are putting this in place to get inside their heads to think about the problem differently. That, that it's, a, it's a slow, but I think that's the most effective way to try and do it. Great. The next question is somewhat related. We hear uh, you about patients wanting to be, data to be shared, but there seems to be a very low risk ap uh, appetite, especially when getting legal advice. What can we do to make sure legal risk avoidance isn't presenting a barrier to data sharing? Okay, the low risk appetite is the lawyers, and, and I'm in the best position to slag the lawyers, I think, in the room. If, if I'm, if I'm, so you have to think about the objectives of what's happening in the room and be fair to people when you're thinking about that. If I'm a lawyer, I'm hired to protect my client. That is my objective, right? And if I want to protect my client, then a low risk appetite is the way I'm coming into that room to think about things. So It's similar answer to the one I just answered in terms of the regulators, but the, risk, the lawyer is always going to put the lowest common risk in place. If you can change the structure where their decision making is a balance not just between risk, but between success and risk, between advancement and risk, right? Not taking risk off the table. So they have to balance those things, then you're going to get better answers. I mean, the, the analogy I use, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the, the movie Finding Nemo. Um, but when Dory and Marvin are looking for Nemo, uh, at one point Marvin says to Dory, I promised him that nothing would ever happen to him. And Dory looks and says, yeah, but then nothing will ever happen to him, right? So. If you want to ensure nothing bad ever happens, don't let anything happen, right? That's, and that's what you're up against, and the lawyers are designed to make that happen. But if, if the objective is to balance risk against making sure good things happen, so you've got to change the calculus of the lawyer, and you're not going to change it with that lawyer in that room. You've got to change it above that lawyer, so they're, they're measuring it differently. And I'll actually just interject and say that the fundamental framework that Global Alliance was built on, and Bartha Knopper, who's somewhere in the audience, helped lead this, is the idea that um, everyone has a right to benefit from science as the primary principle, as opposed to, and it, every consent form I see, it's all about defining the risks. And it's never as much about 
defining the benefit and the right of a patient to benefit and reframing that question, which has been a fundamental approach that Global Alliance has taken with our framework, I think helps sort of set the tone. Do you agree? I, I, I agree. I would add to that, though. Everyone has the right to benefit from science, but everyone also has the right to benefit science, right? right? Because, you know, when, when they opened up at BC Children's the, um, the tissue, like the, the, basically that you could share it, I chased them for a year to say, when can I sign the consent? When can I sign the consent? Right? Because I wanted to be able to know, you know, I don't know if anyone's seen the TED talk where the woman talks about her twin dying at birth. And she goes around to see where all of his tissues went. Right? There's a legacy, there's an importance, there is giving some meaning to the meaningless that drives people. So it's not just that they benefit from the science, but that so they can benefit science. Great point. All right, moving on, open-ended question. Where do you think advocates can contribute effectively but are not able to today? Uh, the hardest place that we're is, is at the um, basic science level, right? And, and so I'd say it's, I think they can do it. I think your phenotype and the number of people who are capable of doing it is smaller on both sides, right? both on the scientific side and the patient side. There is a commitment to education on both sides that has to be there, right? You have to have someone who is prepared to understand the scientific process. You have to have someone who is prepared to understand enough about the science and has enough of a passion and interest in doing it. And by necessity, you're reducing your field of play by having it in that way. But they're still there. And then you have scientists who, who if they put themselves in that position, haven't been trained to think about working with people, um, haven't had those opportunities that you might have if you're sort of a clinician scientist of seeing sort of things in real life. But in the very least where you're seeing it happen, at least as we did it in the, in the EPIC St. Baldrick sort of funded grant, is those scientists get a different bump in the realization of how important what they're doing is and how they're doing it. But that's the place where we could contribute more effectively, but it requires some grindy work to do it effectively. Yeah, good point. Um, how would you describe the system you want to see for rare disease, cancer patients? How would it work? Uh, it would be internationally based, right? It would have a passport system at a uh, clinical approval level so that when, when FDA approves something, it's much easier for Health Canada to do it, or if EMA does it, it's easier for Health Canada to do it so that there's fewer barriers in a small country population-wise. You would see that the uh, ability, so, so there are protocols that work for pediatric oncology that are used internationally, right? And they're shared internationally and there's consortia internationally. What do we do with those patients we are routinely failing, and how do we make our ability to answer questions for those people quicker, more efficient, fast? You know, sequencing is happening all over the place. How do we interrogate that data quicker? You know, how do we get down if it's necessary into proteomics quicker? How do we spit that information out quicker and use that quicker in a way that the system will integrate with? Great. Um, you talked about the needs to balance privacy versus commitment from patients uh, to sharing their data. How can patient advocates uh, help influence policies most efficiently? What do you think are the next steps to facilitate global data sharing? So I, I, I think we're going back to an answer I gave before by being in the room to talk about it, but I, I, will, I will add to that answer is you have to make sure that they're not just going in talking about wanting to impact the science. They have to recognize the importance of privacy, and it's how you integrate those two things. And I think you already answered the yeah. next question about finding advocates, so I'll skip to the other one. How uh, have you seen the data sharing landscape change since you first became involved? Uh, I think I've seen people starting to speak the same language more often now. 
right? There's less silos in terms of I'm going to do it this way and I'm going to do it this way and I'm going to do it this way. I saw that in real time in our profile initiative or even within Canada and three genome centers. They were interrogating the data differently and by having profile, we got a common approach to doing it. So I think we're seeing the recognition of that. I think there is still, from my perspective, from the outside looking in, there is still a little my way is best ism that's out there. Uh, I think that's always going to be exist. The question is not how do we eliminate, the question is how do we bridge between, and I think we're doing that much better than we were doing it 10 years ago. Great. Um, this was a very moving presentation about Finn. Thank you. It was interesting to hear what inspired the creation of the foundation. How has it evolved since its inception? That's a really interesting question. We created the foundation for practical reasons. We were participating in events and it allowed us to pool things, um, to, to be able to help different people meet fundraising goals, that sort of thing. Um, we have evolved it to participate in a whole bunch of things as a way to celebrate Finn's life and we continue to do that. I would say at this point I'm focusing way more time and so there was a point where I switched to focusing more time on advocacy than the foundation and there was an intersection between the two and I came to my own conclusion that I'm a better value add as an advocate embedded in science and while I still do the fundraising it is not my current focus and now I'm trying to figure out I made a switch in, in my law jobs a couple of years ago that has piled on a bunch more work so I'm trying to figure out at one point there's an advocacy tip that a friend of mine says is when you start do everything say yes to everything sort of the Pete Buttigieg approach say yes to all of it now I'm trying to figure out where I orient myself to do the most so it's more a personal evolution than a foundation evolution um, three minutes, okay. Um, so you spoke of doctors going above and beyond and the need for this in the norm, not the exception. How do you resolve the need for such clinical champions and the pressures under, uh, on under-resourced health systems and the frontline clinical workers? Systems, right. They, 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 for, for the doctors who did those things, they were calling on the evenings, they were calling on the weekends, they were emailing their colleagues, they were emailing people they went to school with. That's a, that's a people championing a specific individual. If they could just automatically reach out, that it was easy, that you had broken down the barriers, that's the, then it doesn't take a champion for a specific purpose. It is just part of what you're doing. Great. What do you recommend to give potential advocates the confidence to speak on behalf of their experience? The, the key is to make them understand how important they are, right? That what, what they have to say will make a difference and that they can help move the needle and, and change things by being prepared to do it. And then in terms of education, it's not really the question, but how do you help teach them what stories they want to tell in what experience? I chose the story I told today intentionally. It's not an easy story for me to talk about, but it was important for the underlying message I wanted to send. So that's me using my litigation advocacy skills to inform how I do this job, but this job has made me a better lawyer in how I advocate. So. All right, I think we're going to stop there. This has been just a terrific um, uh, uh, session, and thank you for sharing your story, and thank you for all of the advocacy that you do. Thank you. Let's give a hand for that. I'll also point out that Patrick is uh, competing with Angie for the best nerd clothing with his tie and uh, cufflinks. <laughs> DNA Helix, Angie had dress, earrings, and necklace yesterday, so I uh, encourage all of you to step up um, in that. All right, we're gonna move on to the next session, so I can read it. <laughs> all right, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce uh, Catherine North, who's both uh, Vice Chair of Global Alliance and uh, the Director of the Murdoch Children's Research Institute. She is a clinician scientist, in Melbourne, uh, yes. 
<laughs> in Melbourne, which is where we'll all be next year. Um, uh, she's a clinician scientist focused on the implementation of genomic medicine in, into clinical practice, particularly uh, through the Australian Genomics um, Program, a national network of over 100 institutions across Australia. Catherine. Thanks, Heidi. What a, a tough act to follow, but I think um, you are the reason that we do what we do. Uh, and so thank you for sharing your story so much. Um, what, I'm, what we're looking at uh, today is around bridging the gaps. Um, how have we overcome barriers in terms of implementing genomics into healthcare? And uh, it's been a bit of a roller coaster ride for Australian genomics. Um, and I'm, I'm going to try and capture that today. So this is the crowd that knows this, um, but where we started in terms of clinical utility for genomics, the low-hanging fruit was rare monogenic disease uh, and cancer, particularly the development of targeted therapies. Um, but where we're going is that we're going to be using genomics across the life course, and how do we do that? Uh, it has great predict predictive value, particularly for reproductive technologies and prevention. Uh, it can be used, and it's not quite there yet in terms of prediction in adult healthcare in terms of risk, um, but it's certainly great in terms of predicting risk for cancer. We know its benefits um, for, from a child health perspective with rare disease, uh, but now we're moving back and a number of us are doing projects around newborn screening. So we're really looking at not just within the health system, within hospitals, uh, but how we're bringing genomics into primary care. So this requires a bit of a revolution. Genomics is a disruptive technology. And continually, and I think at the heart, or certainly at the top of the circle of what we do, is the research, which is the generation of evidence uh, to take what we're doing into practice. Um, the dealing with the massive amounts of data, um, but dealing with governments, um, because that, our healthcare system is, you know, that is where, not the barriers are, but that's where we need to move into. And, you know, I, I think about my clinical practice um, in the first 20 years of my career was really at the patient interface. Um, but over the last 10 years, it's been very much about how do we take this research that we do and the Rolls-Royce treatment that we can give to our patients um, if they, you know, turn up to a very specialised clinic, uh, but how can we make an equity of access um, for all to the power of genomics? So after a series of consultations, our government put out what was a targeted call for research called Preparing Australia for Genomic Medicine. Um, and it's obvious that uh, the bid that we put in um, was successful and led to the creation of Australian genomics. This, as you look at what the goals were of this, is a health services research project with implementation science. And I can't say I was an expert in any of these in the beginning. But we were asked to demonstrate patient benefit of genomic testing in one or more diseases, uh, how we can build evidence for cost effectiveness, practical strategies within the healthcare system, uh, but at the same time recognising that we needed to build our research translation capacity in the areas of genomics and healthcare. And the model that we used is, um, is here. What we, what we did is we decided we're sort of like the opposite of Genomics England. We started with looking at what there was within the healthcare system when a patient presented um, to their doctor and what we had to build from an infrastructural perspective um, to guide that journey through our healthcare system. So we started a number of prospective studies where patients were enrolled as they came into clinic across a range of rare diseases and cancers. Uh, and then we, uh, along the way, built up national clinical and diagnostic networks, um, our data infrastructure, the expertise to evaluate what we were doing um, so that we could interface with government with good health economics and also demonstrations of clinical utility. And at the same time, we had to build a genomics literate workforce. So we really started from the ground up. 
This is what Australian genomics, um, you know, it pretty much started this with 100 institutions around the country with every clinical and laboratory service in each state and territory. Australia is a federation. We have um, a federal government that does most of the healthcare funding with a national healthcare system, but the hospital, syst the hospital system is state-based. So we have that as one of the tensions and one of the gaps and divides that we have to face. But taking a national approach with shared leadership around the country was very important. We also built on what was existing in terms of national infrastructure. And let me say that um, my involvement in Global Alliance started at about the same time as we were putting together Australian Genomics. So um, thanks to all of this community because we always looked at what had come before us and we always looked at how we integrated best practice and Global Life Alliance standards into everything that we do. So this is a summary of that first phase in our clinical flagship projects. We didn't just look at one disease, we looked at 19 different rare disease and um, cancer flagship studies, which basically involved providing seed funding where we brought together the clinical craft group. So it was the cardiologists came together, the neurologists came together, the immunologists came together, um, the familial cancer groups came together. Um, and we provided support in terms of genetic counsellors uh, and um, project officers to really deal with the, the data and also we spent um, 18 months at a cost of $4 million to get a national approach to ethics and governance so that it went from that 18 months lag time to a point where we could get funding for a study approved and uh, our uh, uh, record was uh, getting a study up and running around the country within a month. So trying to break down those regulatory barriers by having a system where you could sort of plug and play um, separate disorders. Um, we ended up, I'll talk about um, Mackenzie's mission in a minute, but we ended up at the end of this first five years with 25,000 data donors that became part of our legacy data set that's available for research because our consents have research and data sharing built into them. We also, over that time, we were starting with uh, exome sequencing because that's what, where the price point was, but we've evolved over the time so that we uh, also do, we've moved into everything as whole genome sequencing now. We use uh, RNAs, um, RNA and trans transcriptomics, um, and even in some cases where we've gone into functional genomics, more detailed metabolomic and proteomic studies. So just a couple of examples. Um, we're particularly proud of our acute care genomic study led by Sinitsa over here. Uh, and that started as a small pilot program to get the genomic sequencing down from four months um, to four weeks. Uh, and then eventually uh, to three, a three-day turnaround time. Once we got it to that, we then rolled it out as a national program that was funded by our government, where we had enrolment in every state, um, every state and territory, paediatric and neonatal intensive care, and a team around the country that uh, were, were on call at all times. Over that period, uh, as this national program, we enrolled over 450 kids. Um, the average turnaround time to report was three days. Uh, there was, this was using trios, initially exomes, then moving to whole genomes, and we had a greater than 50% diagnostic yield, uh, and it led to changes in clinical care in 75% of cases. The all-important uh, health economics demonstrated that it did not um, cost too much money. Uh, it actually saved money for our healthcare system by decreasing the time in ICU let alone without even taking into account where it gave kids better outcomes. And I'm happy to say that with a lot of advocacy, um, but particularly by our neonatal intensive care physicians and by, um, by parents and by hospital CEOs, is the day the research funding stopped, uh, certainly in Victoria, our government picked up the bill so that this continued as, as part of um, clinical care. The neonatologists describe it as crack cocaine. Mackenzie's mission uh, was a study that was as a result of patient advocacy. R Rachel was Mackenzie's mum. Uh, Mackenzie was born with spinal muscular atrophy. She died at seven months of age. And they wanted to know why 
they didn't know about the opportunity for reproductive carrier screening to look at their risk. And they were amazing, amazing advocates um, that convinced our health minister to invest $20 million in this study. So this again, um, the goal was to make sure we could do things. It's, we've got a, a country with lots of regional and remote areas. And, uh, and the goal was to recruit um, 10,000 couples. We looked at a panel um, that was curated by a panel of our experts around the country to identify genes um, that would cause uh, severe disability and where we thought that uh, individuals would want the opportunity to have the choice as to whether or not they had screening for those programs. We found that one in 50 couples um, were at high, high risk, so at least a, a one in four risk um, of these disorders. And interestingly, we have um, paid for screening for fragile XSMA and cystic fibrosis, but 80% of the disorders we found were not those three things. So it's demonstrating that we need to think about how we expand that. This rule will require, the barrier is how do you fund this, and this rule will require in the Australian system a different model of funding. So it's been deemed as something that um, people do, the government does want to do, but how do we take a screening program like this at scale in a country for, where we're expanding to 300,000 births per year around the country? Um, let me say, uh, we did everything remotely here because we did this through COVID. And uh, so everything was using our dynamic consent platform, uh, remote gen genetic counselling. So it was taking it out into primary care. And even in this situation, for people that were just having a screening program, 92% consented for secondary data sharing. And uh, as we followed up with them, they found the, the whole process, they were, they were very glad to be involved. So, uh, as, as was said earlier, um, people do want to contribute and the data sets are available to inform future research and so we're do doing studies around reanalysis, around looking at do people want to get their um, ACMG uh, data gene list looked at, so we're, it's building in a whole different range of studies. So at the end of that first point, well, this is where we've been able to get pu publicly funded genetic testing through demonstrating cost effectiveness and clinical utility. Um, so that now as of uh, May 2020, any child presenting with a uh, childhood syndrome or intellectual disability um, has access to genomic testing. And all of those different flagships along the way are, are in line. Um, the rapid whole genome sequencing will have a different funding model eventually um, so that it is uh, readily available, but we'd be co-funded by, hopefully, by our federal government and the state governments. So, after all this fabulous work, um, we were, the goal of Australian Genomics was then to move into a government agency. And uh, in November 2019, a um, finance minister and health minister signed off on making uh, a national government agency. So that was great. It was about to go into the budget in 2020, but we all know what happened then. Uh, we were being ravaged by bushfires, and then there was the blessing of COVID. Um, we were waiting for the plague of locusts. Uh, but as a result, um, we did not move into a government agency at that time. And uh, so Australian Genomics... Uh, was funded for a next wave by our Department of Health. This time not actually doing the research, our, uh, running these pilot programs ourselves, but building up the infrastructure that is required in the country and also enabling other government funded research because our government has um, made a great investment of 500 million over 10 years for genomics research called the Genomics Health Futures Mission. So this is really what uh, we're enabling, the, the goals here has been to um, really enable and make easy research and its translation into practice. We provide that connector interface with governments and our healthcare system, um, with both public and private pathology with industry. Uh, very importantly, how do we um, continue to build a national data infrastructure and make sure we're doing that very difficult pathway of when the research stops, um, making sure we're driving it into policy and practice. And also Australian Genomics acts as a single point of contact um, for our global partners, um, for our communities, and we have a great 
um, patient and consumer advocacy group, um, working with our Indigenous people and making sure we also have an alliance of industry genomic partners. So we're currently supporting um, around 150 projects over a wide range of disorders. Um, we're supporting a functional genomics network that is um, based on the Canadian model and uh, matchmaking clinicians with scientists who can help them work through their variants of unknown significance. And we've developed a digital infrastructure that's supporting the integration of genomics into practice. So we have a national consent, uh, the dynamic um, control, which is our dynamic consent platform. Um, we certainly used it uh, and it, it performed well during the reproductive carrier screening study. Uh, and we're working with, we're very happy to share um, that as we are during the Global Alliance. Um, panel app, uh, we got from our buddies in Genomics England um, and adapted an Australian version in terms of an online platform for gene and virtual gene panel uh, curation. And it's a great international collaboration of how that's continually updated. Uh, and uh, we are finding actually a huge access. It's um, being accessed over 100,000 times a month from over 40 countries. Uh, we have Shariant, it's my, that's my favourite name of one of our tools, uh, where it's around linking all of our laboratory, diagnostic laboratories around the country so that as they curate um, genes, they're uh, putting the levels of evidence in and capturing that and sharing it around the country. Um, and also to make Heidi happy, um, we've had a 2,000% increase in Australian clinical submissions to ClinVar because we've automated the process from Shariant. Um, and then this is one of those gruesome, um, how do we build the infrastructure of government? But we worked with government to develop a framework um, of a national approach to genomics information management. Um, we were then in this second phase of Australian genomics asked to do the prototyping for the next phase, which we did with a, um, a call for expressions of interest and had 12 groups around the country uh, putting things together. And we had many people in this room were part of our international review panel uh, and really gave, were critical friends and gave us great input, which we really appreciate. And now the final version of this is, um, the final report from this is with our government and that will be part of the next phase um, of Australian genomics. So, whither do we go? In, I'm very happy to announce that finally, in March of 2022, um, we had been asked to do a business continuity plan for genomics um, and employed consultants, and we did that, and our pre-budget submission that arose from that was accepted and to provide the ongoing funding for a national agency called Genomics Australia, because they wanted to distinguish it from what's come before. So. Um, now that was great, um, I was announced as the inaugural chair of that uh, and that was in March and then May 2022, um, the, the government lost the election. Uh, so we changed and we had a, um, we now had a different Prime Minister, um, luckily I had chatted to the Shadow Minister for Health um, before the election. And, but we had to wait for the next budget, which they were redoing in October of 2022, to see whether um, this funding would actually uh, get the tick off with bipartisan support. Um, and in the night of, and they wouldn't do anything until that had happened. On the night of the budget coming down, um, we were there, you know, we were sort of refreshing our thing to actually look what was coming up in budget. And Tiff texted me and she went, there's no genomics in the budget. I, um, I started drinking gin and eating chocolate um, <laughs> while Tiffany wrote a sternly worded letter to our Prime Minister, and uh, which <laughs> I think said, said something about our partnership. And, um, but then I got a text at 10 o'clock from you know, the Secretary in the Department of Health saying, oh great, well we can have that meeting now. 
um, on Thursday to, to work out the next stage of Genomics Australia. And I went, but it's not in the budget. And they went, oh, no, that's a good thing. Um, it would have had to be specifically removed from the budget if it wasn't going to happen, which I wish they'd told us earlier. So Genomics Australia is now um, a going concern. So um, of course, we have to redo the consultation all over again because we've got different governments. We have to make sure the states are involved. This was really where we got to with um, and part of our pre-budget submission is that Genomics Australia going forward will look amazingly similar to Australian genomics as it does now, but continuing to perform at, with the government agency, which I think is going to have its benefits and its negatives, but at least there will be a top-down approach rather than us trying to do all of this from the ground up. But really the critical connector, the support of the translation of research into evidence that can then be implemented into policy. Um, pushing forward on the next stage of um, our data infrastructure and making sure that we're capturing research and clinical data sets um, as part of our legacy that we can share nationally and internationally. Uh, making sure we're continuing to grow our genomics literate workforce and then looking at the challenges about how we're rolling out genomics, not just in our hospital system, but into primary care and meanwhile working with the partnerships across industry and our indigenous community. And I'll just end with this is our approach across all of those different areas, but I just thought data would be of interest to this group. These are the challenges that we all face um, in terms of developing these, uh, these ecosystems where we can readily capture and share data and all the uh, legal and regulatory issues associated with that. In the last now seven, eight years of Australian genomics, um, we've really tried to address these in terms of the platforms, um, the phenotype data capture, the uh, integration of international standards and developing the prototype for the country. Um, but now um, I'm chairing a, a group where we're looking at, at the very specific priorities of Genomics Australia across all of these different areas because it will be required to go into a legislation um, to form this new agency. So that's the next gap um, that we have to bridge, but um, I'm feeling uh, much more optimistic that unless some other major international disaster happens, um, we will get there. So um, I'm just the mouthpiece for an incredible group of people um, that uh, really enjoy being part of the Global Alliance and with working with our colleagues around the world. Uh, so thank you. Thank you, Catherine. So we're going to do what we've done similarly. We're going to have all three speakers um, uh, have a session at the end for Q&A. So continue to submit your questions through Slido while we move on to the next talk. Um, but if you can, put the first name, the speaker, in front of your question if it's meant to be directed to one of the um, different speakers, or I'll figure it out. Um, with that, um, it's my pleasure to introduce Andres Metzpalu, uh, head of the Estonian Biobank at the University of Tartu's Institute of Genomics. He has served in diverse roles, including founding and leading the Molecular Diagnostics Center at Tartu University Hospital, and was the past president of European Society of Human Genetics, as well as many other accolades. Uh, with that, uh, Andres, go ahead. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. And I'm also really grateful that I was supported to travel here for this long distance. So basically, I have to um, probably show where Estonia is. My, you see this little uh, green dot on the map, south from Finland and east from Sweden, and um, this Baltic countries. So it is a timeline, and about 25 years ago, we really, just after a few years out of Soviet Union, we really started from the scratch, basically. Uh, and in this 30 years, we had to catch up with the rest of the world. So it, it has been a long um, way up to today. So we, we started uh, Biobank just to build up the infrastructure for genomics and, and personalized medicine. 25 years ago, I'm a medical doctor myself, so, and I used to run uh, next to my professorship also the University Hospital Molecular Diagnostic Lab and Newborn Screening Program, which we founded. 
So it, uh, I had some idea. So we, we took care of the newborns, so we had DNA diagnostics, but what about the adults? So, but, uh, you know, data were coming that we can do something at Rish and Mary Kangas published a paper in, in um, I guess it was 97 or 8, uh, that, you know, Mickey studies don't make it. And uh, you have to do, use the SNPs, but this time there was no technology yet uh, so powerful like to, uh, today. So, but it was clear that the world is moving this way, and the only uh, thing what we are uh, lacking was the samples. And we proposed to government to start a biobank, and government was very supportive, uh, gave 64,000 euros, uh, and um, the rest we have to raise ourselves. And I'm really happy to tell you that uh, we started a program with 4.5 million at, in year 2000, and half of it came from California just not far from here, from Draper Fishery Eurotson. And the second half came from the East Coast and, uh, and the local FFF also put some money. And then we recruited 10,000 and then government was convinced that look, this works, everybody's happy. And uh, then the government started to support it and supporting it up to date. Um, we have a longitudinal approach, so we get uh, everything is electronic uh, because because a good thing was that all the paper records are thrown away and we started from electronics from the beginning. We, we never had a checking in banks, so we just uh, from cash went directly to the, I would say plastic, but uh, mostly it's electronic. Nobody goes to bank and now, nowadays. So it's, um, we got uh, also lots of questions. Uh, we had a long questionnaire and uh, then we get the clinical data. And then we have a visit, we get uh, anthropometric and some object data. So it's, a, it's a quite comprehensive information we are getting from everyone. And um, we have uh, um, clear access rules. Everything is on our website. And we have about today, uh, we have about 210,000 individuals, which is approximately 20% of adult population in the country. Uh, and um, they are all genotyped with Illumina GSA array and uh, imputed against the Estonian uh, full sequence reference panel. And uh, these are the data we're using in GIVA studies and uh, using it for BRS afterwards. So we are funded to sequence next 10,000, and um, so we are going to sequence. Um, well, next week we have the first meeting, and so we are going to sequence. And also, everybody has NMR data from Nightingale Health, uh, Finland. So we have a, everything was started from, from a law, and I'm really happy to say that Bartak Knoppers was very instrumental just to, uh, to draft the law and also inform consent. Uh, only two changes we have made this law. The first one was 2007 when we moved from foundation to the university and, and we asked government, if we want to get this thing into university, please add into the law that you are going to pay for it. And um, it went to the law. We are getting every year like 1.3 million. Depends a little bit on budget, but to get enough to keep the infrastructure, I don't have to worry about the liquid nitrogen to, uh, to power, to IT team, lab, and so on. Uh, but uh, also the law tells what we have to do. And uh, so basically it was a, for research, for science, the biobank, first place. And because university is not providing health care. And so we have to develop and promote the genetic research, collect information, and use the results afterwards in, uh, to improve the public health. And this is what's the vision, our vision of the personal medicine. So I tell you, access rules are clear. If everything, everybody is or somebody is interested, you just can send an application. And, uh, and it, also we discussed in a couple of days that how the data moving, our data are not moving anymore. Uh, tools are moving to the data. And uh, everybody gets his own space in the, uh, in the server. You can do all what you compute. Nobody's using uh, your, or watching what tools you have. You do what you do, but you take away what belongs to you. Everything else stays behind. So the vision is that um, we have to sequence a certain amount of people from the population, have a clear understanding the genomic uh, variations, and, uh, and then chant up everybody. In our case, 
I guess we can get to the, up to the 80%. Now we have 20%, but uh, I see that people are, um, probably 20% of people are still not ready to do any genetics uh, on their own. But uh, if things are moving and people see some benefits, I guess we can go more. And then we just impute this NIP arrays and use PRS for, uh, for finding out the early risks and offer intervention what is available or what is possible. And, uh, and in this way, we, we see that we can, this is an additional tool in the hands of primary care providers how to uh, stratify the patients. So uh, information what we have in Biobank uh, for the research and all these studies is uh, we have um, the full disease trajectory on everyone. Basically, every time people are connecting to the medical system or up in the hospital, whatever, there is a record, and we have all these records. Every time they prescribe the drug, there is a uh, record. We have these records. We, we know also whether they are buying it from the pharmacy. But we only think we don't know whether they are really taking it, but, uh, but uh, we have to assume something. So this is how it looks like. You see, we have more women, of course, because it's, we couldn't send the letters to people. We'd have to go to TV and tell, this is a program, please join. Go to your GP or, or hospital and you, get, uh, you can get involved. Uh, but, um, and also the old people are not represented as much as we would like to see. But, um, but this is what we have. So we are polling them uh, almost every year. And you see, when we, about 70, 75% of people are supporting what we are doing. And um, there are always like 20% who don't know or don't want to, um, 3% are just uh, against. You know, but there's always people who are against or anything. So it's, um, uh, I guess this is, uh, this is good picture uh, just to give us a, uh, and our hopes that we can move forward. I have uh, two uh, examples regarding to just how genomics first can be applied. Because, you know, the doctors always tell of oh, phenotypes, phenotypes, phenotypes. So we have to do a phenotypes. They are collecting 300 uh, data points on myocardial infarction, and then they do studies and using seven. And, uh, and so it's, um, but in many cases, DNA data are produced uh, much faster, more cheap, and there are also lots of information before any of these uh, biomarkers are actually uh, integrative. So uh, we, there is a, uh, one case is familiar hypercholesterolemia, and you, it, uh, when we proposed this study to the cardiologist in hospital, because I wanted to do the hospital-based study, cardiologists was very skeptical, so we know our patients, you don't add anything, so, but not okay if you, if you are really organizing it, then we get paid and everything, so we are part of it. And, and the problem is that um, lots of these patients are going around and say uh, LDL receptor, all these lipids, cholesterol, are, are, are pretty normal, or on the borderline case. And nobody's checking them. And uh, many of these patients are seeing the medical doctor when they are rushed to the emergency unit of the hospital. So we, uh, what we, we went to our biobank from sequence data, we only um, got the data, or let's say variants based on LDR receptor, ApoB and BCSK9 genes, and invited them to cardiologists. And what happened, you know, pre-study, you know, there is 17 people had no study, no diagnosed, 21 had uh, hypercholesterolemia. For these people's recommendation usually was that, look, um, eat less, run more, you know, it goes down. Never does. Only three people had the FH diagnosis. After study, after this cardiology visit, so you see, <coughs> most people got the FH diagnosis, they got statins, and you see, you know, statins, statins are really saving lives. This is what cardiologists tell us. So they are now very happy. So they started their own registry, they're inviting, and they are using genomic data. They would like to get it more. So this is one way to win decisions over to genomics medicine. Because basically there is a lot of resistance. When most of our doctors studied at the university, medical school, there was very little genetics. 
or genomics at all. So this is new for them. And if you just learn something when you are young, you believe this is good for ever. But, uh, but um, what brought us here is not taking us further. So we have to learn. And, uh, and, but the best way is just to show the data. So what happened, you know, we reclassified almost half of the uh, patients and uh, identified 30% of um, new, which are not recognized in the medical system at all. Although primary care providers have to do uh, sometimes, you know, I don't know, say regularly once per year or once per two years, just a cholesterol testing or lipid testing, but you know, everybody is busy and um, people are not showing up also. And uh, I think that uh, this is one example. Also, this is not a very common disease, it's only 0.5%, but if you add up for, the, uh, for 1 million or 300 million here, you, you see there's quite a, uh, lots of people. The second example is from breast cancer. And we all know from the many years that everyone, all women are having a risk about 6% get the ovarian or breast cancer before they get uh, 70 years old. But if you just analyze the data, you see some of them are very high genomic risk, some are low. And if you just took it uh, like top 5%, you, you see that the blue line is the population and the red line is, uh, is uh, top 5% of um, polygenic risk. You see, it happens 20 years earlier. But now the thing is that people are invited to mammography at age 50. You have to be 50 years old in order to get invited. 60% of women are showing up. So 40% are not coming. And lots of women are dead before they get this letter. So that's why now we did again a study. And um, you see, you have to study. Uh, one, we got one cancer case out of 38 in the use of PRS data, 5%. And it took like 244 tests before you get uh, 244 mammography, before you got one cancer case. So PRS is still helpful. And now come and start the program from the next year that they are starting using the PRS and inviting high PRS people to the mammography at age 40. So, we are uh, genomic institute, we do research and we did a project, uh, about 5,000 people got uh, feedback from the biobank and we invited them uh, back to the visits, uh, medical uh, counseling and uh, clinical genetics and uh, physicians were really counseling them and you know, we tried different things like uh, carrier status and pharmacogenomics and uh, common disease, high risk, uh, and so basically uh, tried many things. And um, idea was to see how is to communicate, because this is also difficult. People are different, you know, you have to uh, find the best way to communicate your data. And uh, there's not always like half an hour to talk to them. Sometimes it doesn't really help. So, and we interviewed them before and after the visit and six months later, and the ethics committee was a little bit worried that, you know, what your people do, you know, is you just scare them and they get uh, high risk mutations, they jump from the bridge and so on. But actually it was, people took really very, uh, very normal. It's, they can understand it, they make it, it is valuable. And uh, I think that uh, in these programs, people are expecting bad news. I was talking to one lady who came out of counseling and she said, look, I was waiting almost 15 years just to get the results and they didn't tell me anything. So how come, you know, to have a high breast cancer risk? No. To have a, uh, you know, the antidepressant, because we had pharmacogenomics, that's all. Can you take this uh, antidepressant drug? Yes, I do. You, you, do you have a myocardial heart risk high or no? So how about this? This is good news for you. And then she started to think, yeah, this is actually the good news. And, uh, but people are expecting that you get the bad news if you go and uh, see the doctor. So uh, this is communication thing. So uh, six months later, you know, they were really happy, uh, still happy. You know, they thought that it's the right decision what they did, and it didn't cause harm, uh, they didn't regret. 
So that's why uh, we are ready now to move to the uh, population based thing. And uh, I, okay, I have to, to go back. You know, so, <coughs> so that's why we are proposing another comment. And look, uh, we have to now jump up uh, as many as possible. And I think we don't have to bank the DNA anymore. We just have to keep the data. Because in our biobank, you see we have 200,000 people and uh, more than 12, 12 million samples. And 88% of these samples have been used only twice. For channel typing or NMR. Because what people do nowadays, I mean our collaborators, they want to get data. Very few cases they need the DNA or plasma to do something which we haven't done. So I think that uh, it's much easier if you really need new samples, it's just invite them back uh, and uh, get a fresh sample, which is uh, useful anyway. So there's lots of problems, of course. You know, in Europe, we have this medical device directive. We have to develop medical devices for every test, which is also software. And, um, and uh, this is new thing. Nobody knows how to uh, do it and who is has to approve it and so on. So it develops slowly. And, uh, and in Europe also, uh, health care is uh, to the member countries. So there's no central thing. And uh, now, based on all this data, we've got the EU grant uh, together with, um, with uh, collaborators for the next six years, so 30 million, to develop this uh, further, to do more clinical tests, because uh, clinicians want to see medical utility, validity, and, uh, and usefulness, and so on, and uh, all evidence-based things. And uh, this is the structure. You see Erasmus University in Rotterdam and Helsinki University are our partners and also University Hospital and, and Minister of Education and, and Research and Health Care. So finally, I'm also involved in, in European activities and already it was mentioned before about you know, GDA and also as soon as part of it last four years, we developed also IT infrastructure what is needed to use the genomic data in health care. So that's why we are ready to start next year to, uh, to primary care level. And, uh, I guess uh, the plan to sequence half a million people across Europe uh, is uh, a new genomes, not uh, other half, uh, half a million will be the um, existing or, or legacy or clinical data. So we, are, we have a, a 39 population to be sequenced in this um, program. Uh, we are expecting to get 40 million uh, and uh, start doing it. So 40 million allows us to do um, about 100,000. We use short read and part of it will be long read. We are, not, we are pretty agnostic of uh, what technology people are using, but we are not bringing all samples into one place. Most countries want to do their own sequencing, but we have centralized quality uh, control system. And so we want to make sure that data in this uh, sequencing are high quality. We are not collecting phenotypes except age and sex, but um, next phase when they are going to use imp imputation of arrays, so these people have to have, the array people have to have a maximum phenotype that is possible. So this is a plan for up to 2027, and I guess that's why I'm putting it up that, you know, huge uh, sequencing activities here and big programs like all of us or Pan Genome and big centers. So Europe is pretty fragmented. Estonia is 1.3 million. We have one genome center, one university hospital, uh, two major hospitals at all. So in a, sometimes it makes things easier, but of course um, there is just not enough people to do everything, all this development. But to, that's why we have to collaborate and we are really happy to to collaborate. So thank you very much. Great, thank you. And our final speaker of this session before we move on to our discussion panel is Alastair Thompson, who serves as a senior advisor for data innovation at the Advanced Research Projects Agency for Health, or ARPA-H. 
um, where he ensures that ARPA-H data adheres to fair standards and supports ARPA-H's health equity mission. He formerly served as the chief information officer for NHLBI, where he led the development of the Biodata Catalyst. Alistair. Uh, first, thank you for the invitation. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about some of the things we're doing. Um, and I really want to thank Patrick for reminding us that data is a strategy. Uh, it's not the end goal. Uh, I think that's very, very important for us to, uh, to recognize. Um, there it is. Green. Good. OK, let me uh, talk a little bit about Upper H uh, for you to start with, because I'm sure many of you heard of it, don't really understand what it is, and I think it's important you understand our mission and, and, and how we actually operate. So our mission is really pretty simple. It's accelerating better health outcomes for everyone. There's two key parts I want you to look at in that. One is health outcomes. So we're very much about making measurable impact to pe real people's lives. This is not about basic research. It's about translational research. Uh, and the everyone is also incredibly important. A uh, key part of our mission is equity and diversity uh, in those outcomes and making sure that we're serving everyone globally uh, with the work that we do. Um, it was launched uh, by President Biden not too long ago now. I think we've just had our first official birthday. Um, and he wants to really pursue innovative ideas that break the mold of how we've traditionally done research. Um, and you can see his, his quote there, if only, if only we would try. Uh, and so our job is to try things which are a bit out there. Um, in that model, uh, he turned to a model that's been proven. Uh, so in the, the world of ARPAs, um, we talk about ARPA hard problems, problems that we don't know what the solutions are, but if we could only get the, to a solution, they would have a huge impact. So DARPA, the first ARPA, um, imagine if an aircraft could all be, be all but invisible to radar to enable it to penetrate into enemy airspace unseen. And that resulted in uh, DARPA and Lockheed Martin producing the Have Blue aircraft, which you can probably recognize the shape. It turned into the F-117A, um, the first truly stealthy aircraft that it's retired now, but uh, that's the kind of impossible thing that you could imagine. You know, I can just imagine the conversations with the Air Force generals that went, hey, we've got this idea for a really slow aircraft that can't carry much, maybe one bomb, but uh, it'll be completely invisible. And they're going, right, sure, that's a great idea. Uh, and so they pursued it for a relatively small amount of money to get to the point where the Air Force was going, OK, that's good. We, we can see how that will work. We'll invest $30 billion in it. And that's very much the model of ARPA-H. It's getting over those hurdles, de-risking technologies. And it's important to recognize it's technologies that we're dealing with uh, to result in uh, discoveries that can be put in the hands of companies or other organizations to then uh, pursue. And so we've got some examples. These are not necessarily real, although one of them in the middle, there is someone looking at. Um, what if we had a personalized cancer vaccine which costs as little as a cup of coffee? That'd be pretty amazing. Uh, you, know, you hear about everything that's going on in cancer, the cost of immunotherapies, the cost of uh, CAR T cells. Uh, what if it cost of a, co a coffee? What about a, a 3D printed heart? What if you could, uh, you know, forget about heart transplants, 3D print a heart and put it in derived from the patient's own cells so there's no question of rejection? What about a surgical nanorobot that could be delivered by a pill? Again, pretty cool. Do we know how to do that? Nope, not a clue. <laughs> but these are ARPA hard problems that uh, we, we might, we might not solve. So, ooh, there's a big thing in the middle. I don't know where that came from. <laughs> um, ARPA-H operates differently to NIH. We are not NIH in, in, in the way that we, uh, that we go. Um, we're centered on our program managers. So a program manager is someone who comes in with an idea about how to change the world attack one of these ARPA hard problems. Um, and so our, our portfolio is a reflection of our program managers. Um, we talk about the program manager flywheel, and the, the program managers, they come in, they've got three to six years to make a difference, and then they go. And so there's this constant turnover of new ideas that come in. Uh, but we don't do generally hypothesis-driven research. 
we do technology development driven by the program managers. And we do that through this model where we, we take the idea, we work with the program manager to launch it, we identify performers, uh, people who can come in under contract to do the work, often doing the same thing in different ways. Uh, and we measure them, we measure them rigorously uh, with metrics to make sure that they're actually making progress. And if something is not working, we stop. I know it's an innovative thought. I mean, if it's failing, don't do any more. Um, so yeah, we will stop and we'll put the money where it makes most sense to put it. Um, and then I think one of the most critical <laughs> things here is this question of transition, in that we don't just stop with the research. Every, every program is designed from the get-go to transition to some form where it can actually benefit uh, people. Uh, and so this might be engaging with pharma early on in a, a device or drug development process so that there was someone to transition it to. We might take something, a drug, through phase one and two trials and then hand it over to someone to go to phase three because by that point, the risk has been reduced to a sufficient point where they're willing to invest the billions of dollars to do a 100,000 person phase three clinical trial. So the, we've heard great things from my colleagues here about where uh, we're starting to use genomics in clinical practice, but they're small steps. Uh, I was really pleased to see Catherine's notes about the successes that they've had, the, the financial benefits of it, um, to see the actual reductions in, in getting, or getting people into treatment for cholesterol. Uh, in Estonia. Those are great stories, but they're small steps. So what are the other hard problems that uh, we might address? So we all understand, I think, you know, how genomics in all its forms uh, can be used, is really essential to healthcare in the future. Uh, identifying rare diseases, understanding mechanisms of disease in an individual patient in, in true personalized medicine way, uh, understanding the impacts uh, tailoring treatments, understanding the pharmacogenetics, uh, so that you give, give uh, patients the, the treatments that are going to have the, the greatest effect, and the ones that pose significant risks to them. Um, there are all ways that we can, in a personalized way, uh, tailor treatments to people and help them uh, uh, improve. But there are challenges. Um, we still have challenges with access to sequencing technologies. It's got much, much cheaper. It's not cheap enough to be able to put everywhere. The cost and scalability of it is, is problematic, particularly if you're looking at the higher end genomics, whole genome sequencing, or some of the things that we need to deal with uh, in, in the epigenetic world, whether it's methylation, RNA-seq, which we haven't even thought about how we would put those in the clinic yet. Um, the availability in clinically certified labs, the vast majority of whole genome sequencing is in research labs. It's not in clear certified labs in the US. Um, Availability in smaller and low-technology health delivery organisations. Yep, might be in big academic uh, research centres, but it's not in uh, a rural hospital in Tanzania. Uh, and that's where, if we're truly going to be successful, we have to get this technology. Um, we've still got bar uh, barriers to really understanding the, the clinical significance of variation. Uh, and we heard Karen talk about the pangenome and how it's trying to address some of these things, like the complexity of uh, the HRA region. Um, understanding copy number variation and structural variants, which, you know, short read technology is not good enough. Um, the interaction of germline and tumor variation uh, in cancer, that, you know, the tumor may say, yes, this is exactly the right immunotherapy for me, but there's other pharmacogenetics going on that mean that for an individual that's not going to work. Uh, we have no good ways of dealing with these things today they present opportunities for us. And these are the kinds of opportunities that RPH, I think, would like to be able to pursue. Uh, addressing equity, expanding access uh, to clinical genomics, getting the cost down, making step changes in the technologies, particularly the, the, the going beyond whole genome sequencing uh, to other areas. Um, but also expanding access to diverse data sets. We've heard a lot of people talking about, and Patrick talked about the issue of privacy, but that patients want to offer their data for research. Um, how do we actually do that in a way that makes sense, that respects privacy, respects sovereignty, uh, all of those kinds of things? 
but it's also about uh, diverse references. Again, you heard Karen talk about the pan genome. Um, we need to understand the clinical impacts of variation, um, but we also need to educate clinicians in how to interpret it. I think this, I can't remember who it was made the comment that you know, clinicians are just starting to understand you know, th that SNP variation is something they need to be thinking about. Well, what about you know, complex variants? How are we going to educate them? And so there's opportunities there, I think, for you know, AI-based decision support uh, to help them understand but we, we don't have the things that we need to be able to achieve that today. Um, we need to expand access to whole genome sequencing data for research. Um, we need to support a uh, global federation that requests sovereignty of data. Uh, it was interesting when, uh, Pete, was it Peter or you and I can't remember which made the comment about that, you know, federation kind of surprised us. But yeah, that's where we've got to go. But it needs to be much more fine grained. I've started talking about micro federation where individual, individual labs can be federated uh, and, and make their data available. Um, making real world se sequencing data from clinical environments available, uh, along with the real world data from the electronic health records and the, the rest of the information that we have about a particular patient. Um, improving and standardizing sequencing and bioinformatics methods, making long read sequencing available uh, at a cost that is reasonable and can be performed uh, uh, quickly and easily. But also thinking beyond basic genomics and thinking about epigenetics. Um, we've got a growing understanding that epigenetic factors have a huge clinical significance. Uh, and so how do we think about introducing epigenetics into the clinical practice? We need step change improvements in epigenetic methods, single cell methods, spatial methods, sequencing, research into the clinical significance. What's challenging with that is that we needs huge data sets to be able to understand. Huge data sets from multiple cell types, multiple tissue types to be able to do it. Um, and along with geolocation data, environmental data, social determinants data. Uh, that's all very hard to get at today. So how do we attack these kinds of things? So there's a series of kind of ARPA hard problems that I've sort of outlined here. Uh, I'm not going to go through them because uh, the clock tells me I'm ticking down. Um, but it, we have a, a whole series of problems, and I want to look at one of them, which is how do we bring diverse data sets and data types from across domains together? Many platforms, many um, silos, unfortunately, by domain, by country, whatever. I was excited by the GDI initiative that Melissa talked about. Um, I think it's heading in the right direction, but we've got to go even further than a, you know, linking national data. So, so, Imagine if new data integration tools made it possible to get more value out of health research data produced by thousands in lab, of labs and hospital centers across the world. Uh, we like these imagine if things at, at ARPA-H. And so I'd like to introduce you to the Biomedical Data Fabric Toolbox Program, which is a collaboration between ARPA-H and NCI. Tanya, sitting over there, wave, talk to her about it. She'd love to talk to you about it. Um, <laughs> which is really about addressing research data access and interoperability uh, in ways that we haven't done today. And so, I, I, again, I'm not going to go through this. We know our problems. Data's in silos. Much of it is hidden. No one can get it. You can't find it. We've done a pretty good job of improving you know, the F and the A of FAIR and making things findable and, and, and accessible. We haven't done very well on making it interoperable and reusable. So how do we do that? How do we get to this world of tomorrow where we have these interconnected, federated data sets where they will all interoperate, where they will, the, the data is harmonized so you can easily build a cohort across it and analyze data across it. And so the data, by the medical data fabric toolbox uh, is aimed at making research data easy to use, reducing the effort for, for data integration, um, developing new data fabric capabilities and tools uh, things that just don't exist today. Um, while we are certainly going to leverage GA4GH standards, we hope to go well beyond them uh, and also to help drive into GA4GH standards. Um, and we want to build you know, health data models that can be applied across disciplines. You know, the first use case for this is cancer, but we need to quickly move to other areas because cancer has unique characteristics that other diseases don't, uh, and we need to be all-encompassing. And We can't tune this too finely for cancer we've got to be able to deal with kidney and diabetes and, and heart, lung, blood, sleep uh, disorders. Uh, we have five technical areas we're pursuing. One is about automated data collection. 
from instrumentation and from electronic health records? How do we get better metadata? If you're talking about uh, whole genome sequencing, how do we get information with the data about how the library was built, which we don't even capture today? That might be in notes somewhere, but we don't capture it. How do we get experimental intent in the protocol, which has been written down in, in a notebook somewhere? How do we bring that in so that the data is, is able to be used by a, a third party uh, when they're done? AI-assisted data curation. We all, I'm sure, understand the problem of harmonizing data. Different terminologies, different vocabularies applied to it. Can we use AI, particularly large language models and other generative AI methods, uh, to harmonize that data, at least as a first pass, so that it's more interoperable at, from the get-go? How do we use AI to improve data exploration across this federated data ecosystem that could span the globe? Um, we do user testing. Uh, it's an important in the ARPA world to actually get this out in real labs so that people uh, are uh, actually using it so we can see what works and what doesn't. And then finally, the last one is cross-domain generalization and integration. Uh, this is one I'm particularly interested in because I'm leading it. Uh, but it's really about what does it look like to produce a, a reusable, executable architecture with standard APIs, standard ontologies that can be deployed across scales. It could go into an appliance that gets deployed in a lab and makes that lab's data available uh, with consistent authentication and authorization, using passports, for instance, uh, makes the data, uh, all the harmonization is available, standard experimental protocols are available so that the data starts off consistent, uh, but can also be, be deployed, uh, for instance, in an indigenous people groups uh, on their land. Uh, so that they retain sovereignty and control over the data. Um, that's a, a really important factor uh, we're looking at in the data fabric, is how do we give control uh, to uh, indigenous peoples to, to be able to manage their own data, but also to patients to, to opt in to research for their data using dynamic consent methods, that, that similar to what Catherine was, was talking about. Um, we regard that as a critical part of what we're doing if we're going to really address the equi equity question. These are all ARPA hard problems, and we hope to really engage with GA4GH on many of these. Um, this is just some of the areas where you know, we know that we're going to be uh, engaging. There is probably others. Um, we hope to, uh, as I say, we will adopt, we will implement, but we, will, we hope to move beyond. Uh, so one of the examples I've been talking about uh, with, with folks in the last few days has been about federated learning. Uh, there are no standard APIs, there's no standard methods for federated learning. So we hope to be able to drive that so that you can actually learn from data that's in this data fabric scattered all over the globe uh, and use those for your machine learning models while keeping the sovereignty and all of the other things that we need. We hope to work with GA4GH on developing standards for those kinds of things. It's a key part of what we want to do. Um, and I will leave you with this, which has kind of become a, uh, something of a mantra for us. Um, this present moment used to be the unimaginable future. Um, think of that as you look at the things that, that ARPA H is doing and what you're doing to really push the boundaries. Because the things that we feel like are impossible today, uh, tomorrow, are just going to feel commonplace. And so thank you for your time. All right, so um, uh, we are going to now do our panel discussion, and I've, I've been looking at lots of questions coming in. I added a couple myself. Um, so let's start with, uh, well, it looks like mine got upvoted. I'm, in the US, most carrier screening starts after pregnancy, which is not ideal timing. Catherine, how do you manage the timing to get carrier screening preconception, which I assumed was the case, but maybe not? Yeah, um, in the reproductive carrier screening study, I think we had around, I can't remember the exact figure, I think about 20% um, were already pregnant uh, at the time, uh, and we expected that because that's when people are starting to think about carrier screening. Uh, but this is really then, it's a public awareness and communication through primary care. So we did work across uh, general practitioners and uh, obstetricians as well in terms of alerting people to the because this was done as a research study but it's that sort of public engagement of knowing that, that um, this is available 
and eventually we want to make it available to everyone so that there will be a point in time, I mean, this is very common in the Ashkenazi mm -hmm. Jewish population, they've been doing it for years. This is just at a, at a different scale. So it is about that public engagement uh, for people um, who want to have a choice in terms of their reproductive uh, mm -hmm. decisions. The other thing that's important to note is that we did also offer, as part of the study, um, uh, access to free pre-implantation genetic diagnosis to see if they used that information. Uh, and then uh, for those that were pregnant, they'd uh, go on to have other screening if they were at risk. Got it, that makes sense. So I'm gonna try my best to alternate across the three speakers. Um, uh, Alastair, do you make information available on the idea that option to request, whoops, <laughs> sorry, we're moving around. The level of, uh, do you make information available on the ideas that don't work out in case anyone else wants to pick them up later? That's a really good question. I, I, I don't know the answer because I think we're too brand new to figure that out and all the other ARPAs in intelligence and, you know, defense and homeland security are all, well, they're all classified. So. Um, I would hope that we would. Um, uh, I think that's actually a really good point, which I will take back uh, to the team. Great. Um, Andres, the level of cohort recruitment in Estonia is a substantial 50% uh, of proportion of Estonia. Is there a goal to do everyone living in Estonia? No, we have a, like 20%. Right now it's at 20% yeah. uh, mm -hmm. recruitment. Yeah, I, the code is just to do everybody, because if you want to uh, get uh, health care based on genomics, you have to be in the system like, uh, like normal, but it takes a little bit more time. But I see that probably next, um, it's up to 2030, which could reach to the 80%. Great. Um, Catherine, is your dynamic consent entirely electronic? Does the individual have the option to request one-on-one -on -one counseling? Are there sufficient GCs to staff the needs? Uh, I'll start with the third question, no. <laughs> uh, and I think that's the, an international problem. But uh, certainly technology does help. The dynamic consent platform, you know, is usually done on an iPad, for example. Um, but it's assisted depending on what you're consenting for with, you know, they can sit and watch videos and background information. Um, there, it is underpinned uh, with uh, you know, a large group of genetic counsellors. But when we were, say, looking at reproductive carrier screening, uh, we could automatically provide to 49 out of 50 couples that they were at low risk for what was tested. Um, but there is a more intense follow-up for the one in 50 uh, that were demonstrated to be at high risk. Great, thanks. Uh, Alastair, perhaps the hardest questions in healthcare data sharing are cultural. Is ARPA-H able to tackle... Oh, where'd it go? Uh, <laughs> Well, our, uh, questions of policy and legislation and stuff. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, there, uh, there it is. Is, is RPH uh, able to tackle questions related to policy, community, etc.? Short answer is is yes. The the longer answer is we're trying to integrate questions of policy, community, etc. In, into every program where it's uh, appropriate. Um, you know, we're mandated to work with FDA on some of their policies. We work closely with ONC, other components of, of the U.S. government. We plan to work with. Uh, groups internationally, uh, we know that we need to deal with issues, for instance, around GDPR, and those are areas that we want to tackle. But the other side of it is that we're going to fund a great diversity of programs. Uh, you know, our DigiHeals program that launched uh, a, about a month ago, you know, is about cybersecurity uh, in, in healthcare systems. Um, we, I expect that we will have um, programs which are focused purely on policy. Uh, and, and other factors. Uh, and if you've got ideas for those, please apply to be a program manager. <laughs> Great. Um, so this one is for all three of you from Pat Patrick. If the scientific process is benefiting from the patient gift of data, how do we or have we built in structural mechanisms for paying back that gift by sharing scientific advances with those patients? I, I think that uh, we certainly have built that in in terms of the dynamic consent platform. Uh, the consent that we ask for is, is quite granular in terms of where people want to share their data. For example, for research in their own disorder, do they want to will they give consent to share with industry, for example. Uh, but they can also go back in at any time, but we also use it as a two-way 
communication mechanism. So uh, providing updates of the study in which they've participated. So uh, we will build out on that, but I do see these, uh, the digital platforms as ways of providing constant updates and interaction. Great. Andres or Alastair, do you also want to weigh in on that question? No, our, in our case, people are sharing data. We, uh, clinical data can be used in research, and uh, it's more difficult to get research data into, uh, into health care. But for the power bank, we managed to do it. We had to go through certain checks and controls. And finally, these 200,000 genotypes uh, are put into the um, uh, e-health system to be used. But basically, I would say, uh, we have to generate data in healthcare system in order to be uh, absolutely on the safe side. Yeah, I, you know, I talked about dynamic consent. I believe passionately about enabling patients to opt in to research because I think experience shows us they really want to. But the other side of that is to be able to then track how their data has been used in research and be able to let them see visibly what the benefits have been. I think that's critically important to encouraging them. We, we talk a lot about marketplaces and things. There's a marketplace of, oh, I gave my data. I did something good. And I think that's why we're, you know, GF or GH's philosophy on, on the right to participate in science and the right to benefit from it is so critical to my thinking about the way that we're pushing things forward. Great. Um, Reese asked, how confident are you in the legal, clinical, financial, and other incentives in your home countries that they align with goals for clinical data sharing? If not, what needs to, to change? It's for all of you. <laughs> I, I might tackle that. I, I think first and foremost in everything we do is uh, really looking at the legal and regulatory issues and the ethics. It, it sort of, it starts with that um, and then we, we continue. So I, I think we make that robust because we see in everything, like you know, the reproductive carrier screening, uh, we were really concerned that there would be a very negative public backlash, comments about eugenics, or you know, those sort of that negative way of approaching it. So being on the front foot in terms of uh, the, those legal issues that you're talking about, making the patient benefit very obvious. Um, but uh, I think two big things is uh, the patient advocacy, um, the story of Rachel Casella, um, you've heard the story from Patrick today, is she really was the face of this program. Um, but, uh, you know, secondly, the real emphasis that this is about choice. This is making this testing available and it, it's just expanding it. So people to have reproductive carrier screening all the time, um, but it's just not at this scale. So it's it's trying to take, uh, put it out there, but in a very, um, the choice of the individual is paramount. Thanks, Catherine. Yeah, in, in our case, we have, um, I guess, the last four years, basically, all these legal LC systems were redesigned just to meet these requirements. We have data protection agency, we have an uh, ethical review board, and uh, basically, all projects have to go through this one and meet their standards. But uh, there is an uh, important thing that um, people are willing to share. And they are, it's, it's, this is most important that people really want to do it. But we have to make sure that this pseudo anonymized data stays safe. We have a problem in the US with HIPAA. By the way, neither of those P's in HIPAA are privacy, despite everyone seems to think it that way. The number of times that you know, I personally had to deal with, with institutions who go, oh, no, can't do that, but HIPAA. Uh, and yet, you know, HIPAA was designed to empower patients to take control of their data and make it portable so it could be used, yes, for insurance, but also for research. Uh, and so there's a fundamental problem with the way it's being interpreted um, that may need some uh, adjustment in legislation or policy. Um, but it's also a problem that uh, there's no marketplace for that data, so there's no incentive for a health delivery organisation to do the, make, take the effort to share that data, even if the patient wants it shared. And so one of the things we're looking at is, well, how do we create a marketplace for that data 
so that there can be fair compensation between consumers of the data and those who produce it, with the patient in the middle as the mediator of who can access. That sounds awesome. Um, uh, Alistair, why go beyond Global Alliance rather than pushing boundaries with us? Uh, it's, it's a characterization. <laughs> um, that's exactly, that's the intent. It is pushing the boundaries with GA4GH. But what I'm going to say, go beyond. We will go beyond the current standards. We know that. Um, absolutely, we will be working with GA4GH. And, and if you wish to partner with GA4GH and submit a proposal for the, the biomedical data fabric, we would absolutely welcome that. Great. Catherine, frequency and distribution of disease-associated genetic variants can vary significantly by popula across populations. Could you talk about Australia Genomics efforts with the indigenous populations of Central Australia? Uh, yes. Uh, we have uh, we've been very um, aware all the way along that indigenous research, and particularly in the area of indigenous genomics, has to be indigenous-led. And so over the past five or six years, we've worked very closely with the Indigenous community, which does now has fabulous leadership, and also they have um, also joined forces around the country. So it takes time uh, working with our Indigenous people, as they say, moves at the speed of trust, and we're very res respectful of that. Uh, the, they've partnered um, in terms of uh, where, where it's up to, uh, they've partnered with Daniel MacArthur's group, um, who's just sequenced the first thousand Indigenous genomes. Uh, and, uh, but the interpretation and the sovereignty of that data then goes back to um, our Indigenous researchers. We're also looking at how we able and build up the community as well. And I'm excited to add that that data from Daniel will be in aggregate going into NOMAD. Um, all right, next question for Alastair. How can we stay informed about ARPA-H's work and the impact on health research and healthcare in general? Uh, the best way at the moment is social media, uh, the platform formerly known as Twitter, um, <laughs> LinkedIn in particular. You'll see announcements about what we're doing, results and things coming out there. Again, we're very new. The whole communication strategy will be there. If you like listening into hearings in Congress, there will be some, I'm sure, over the next uh, year or two, you could listen into those, which I'm are bound to be entertaining. <laughs> Excellent. Andreas, you mentioned people have to apply for access through an IRB. Will they have access to all data or only that specific to their research? Of course, specific to the research, but the research process can be different. And we are, uh, you know, it starts so that you first try to buy a bank. And, okay, you're asking uh, certain ICD-10 code. Let's say, I need, do we have 1,000 breast cancer cases or whatever? So, and the uh, yes, we do. Then you just have to come up with a specific project. You need cases, controls, whatever. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but if you would like to make a questionnaire that we will send uh, certain questions to 200,000 people, and you're expecting answers which they can do uh, over the internet. This is a different thing. So it all depends on projects. But you, you can't get access to the full biobank like a fishing expert. Okay, give me a biobank, I go and what, what is interesting there. So this is not going through. Great. Um, I'm going to do one more question because we are just about out of time. Catherine, f apart from fire, plague, pestilence, and change of, of governments, <laughs> what were the barriers at the clinical colophase that needed to, over to be overcome for Australian genomics to succeed? I, I, think, um, I think the biggest uh, ongoing barrier is uh, the, the structure, our governmental structure. And I think we all face that in different ways. So you have to learn how to work around it because ultimately, when you're looking at a technology that we want uh, universally rolled out in our healthcare system and in primary care, you have to work with government. Uh, we have a, the central federal government that funds some parts of the health system, and we have state governments. And it's probably, there's a, um, a ping pong game that goes back and forth of who pays for what. That's, and that's why we're, working centrally, but also from the Genomics Australia perspective, um, there's a lot of thoughtful consultation going on now where the states will get what they want 
as well, so that hopefully, yeah, it'll end up as a harmonious enti entity that's really looking at what we need to do uh, best at a whole of country level and, and Tiff's having a little hysterical laughter in the background. <laughs> Well, those of us in the U.S. are envious. Um, okay, on that note, I do want to remind everyone that there are posters around the room, and in our break, which is about to happen, encourage you to visit those posters. So with that, we will break now, and a hand for all of our uh, panelists. Thank you. Recording in progress.
Hi, Nick. Can you hear us? I can. Can you hear me? Hello? Hello? Can you hear me? We don't hear you at the moment, so just um, one second. Let's figure out why we can't hear you. Um, so he was able to hear. Um, I saw him responding, though, and I, I we don't hear him. Oh, okay. Okay, but I did see his, like, levels moving, so... Okay. Um, Nick, can you try speaking once more? We just had the speakers muted. Okay, I'm speaking now. Okay, can great. You hear me? You're good. Um, oh, okay. So we're all set. Um, this mic that I'm holding right now will give to the moderator, um, Heidi, so she'll introduce you. Um, and then also she'll be using this mic to, to moderate the Q&A. Um, so you should be able to hear her clearly. Perfect. Just and let me then know just what as a reminder, um, after your presentation, just keep your mic uh, muted on Zoom uh, until the Q&A starts again. Thank okay. you. Okay. And do you want me to turn on my video in Zoom, or do you want me to just do it audio only? All right. Okay. And did you let him know we need to, he needs to move?
This one is on. Do you want this one? Testing. OK. All right, we are going to get started with our next session. Um, I think uh, you're welcome to come up here. Uh, I think we're going to start with Nick, but you can sit here. OK, good. Um, all right, our first speaker, unfortunately due to illness, will be joining us virtually. Um, but I'm delighted to introduce Nick Encina, uh, who's been a successful entrepreneur, having started many companies. Um, but is currently the director of strategy and co-founder of the Precision Population Health Program, spanning Ariadne Labs, Harvard School of Public Health, and Brigham Women's Hospital. And he's also executive director and co-founder of the International Consortium on Newborn Sequencing, or ICONS. Um, with that, I will let Nick give his talk. And then uh, we'll do the same thing. Um, you can enter questions. Please put the speaker's name into Slido so we know which person it's for or no name if it's for everyone. And you can queue them up. And then uh, at the end, we'll have a joint panel discussion. Thanks. Nick. Thank you, Heidi. <clears throat> and thank you all for, uh, for having me here. Thank you to the GA4GH uh, committee for inviting me and Heidi for moderating this panel. Uh, I do want to apologize for missing out on being in person. I picked up a case of COVID this week, uh, which obviously affected my travels. Uh, but I will do my best not to say something disastrously wrong. And if I do, it wasn't me. It was the Mucinex talking. <laughs> um, I think I have slides that were going to be presented. Should I present? I was told that somebody else would be presenting for me. Uh, that's a good question. Um, do we have slides for Nick? Yes, they're coming. OK. So while they're loading, um, I, I'm really excited to be talking during this, uh, this segment on bridging the gap, uh, overcoming challenges in translating from research to clinical care, because that's actually precisely the work that we do both at Ariadne Labs, uh, the, the program that I helped start there, Precision Population Health, uh, and then also the International Consortium on Newborn Sequencing. So uh, I'm delighted to be sharing more on that. If you could go to the next slide, please. So oh, I think these are the old slides. In any case, uh, I will share. Uh, so uh, this is an old slide um, that's, all right. Hopefully this doesn't include all the old sites. So in any case. Actually, uh, Nick, should we stop and just see if there's the ability to swap to the slides? Yeah, I could present as well, if it helps. Is that possible in the back that Nick can just present his slides himself, share through the Zoom screen? There's a discussion going on. Hold on. <laughs> This is when my stand-up comedian uh, skills would have come in handy if I had any, but sadly, not so much. <laughs> Where's David Glazer? He's the head of the program committee. Where's your skills, David? <laughs> yeah, David, your local tip. So has anyone been to the chocolate place that David recommended? Does it? Oh, who? I heard someone say yes. Yes, we have a taker of the chocolate. And was it good? Excellent. We have a heart, heart-shaped love of chocolate. And, and did you bring me any? <laughs> I'll be expecting that later today. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right. Please turn on. Uh, are we set? All right, so let me share my screen. Can you see my screen? Yes, success. All right, perfect. All right, sorry about that. So uh, I'll be talking about precision population health and the International Consortium and Newborn Sequencing as they relate to bridging the gap. Uh, just briefly, my uh, the positions that I hold today are I'm executive director and co-founder of the International Consortium on Newborn Sequencing, also co-founder and director of strategy for Precision Population Health at Ariadne Labs, and I hold the post at Harvard School of Public Health. 
The team is an extraordinary group of people. Dr. Robert Green leads us, and we have uh, phenomenal specialists and, and experts uh, spanning from implementation specialists to genetic counselors and various different uh, senior level scientists that do the work. And one of the things I wanted to take a pause on was you're going to hear a lot of different terms and they can be confusing because it's academics and so there are acronyms and all kinds of things. So just to show you a little bit of what the structure looks like, Ariadne Labs, which is where I work and where we started the program on precision population health, is a joint center for health system innovation between Harvard School of Public Health and Brigham and Women Hospital. It's technically half and half. Heidi, you're very familiar with this with the Broad having originally been Harvard and MIT. Uh, Ariadne Labs was actually founded in the image of the Broad, but focusing more on the implementation science of uh, clinical care uh, by Dr. Atul Gawande. So within Ariadne Labs now, we have a number of different programs. The one that I helped start was the Precision Population Health Program, which I'll describe in a second. And as a branch from that is the International Consortium on Newborn Sequencing. So I hope this gives you a little bit of context as I go through the rest of the slides. At a high level, what we focus on at Ariadne Labs is really follow through innovation. So how do we take leading edge science and technology, uh, best practices in clinical care, and make sure that they get to the hands of clinicians in a way that's accessible and actionable um, you know, to primary care clinicians and, and generalists. Um, specifically, we also focus on what we call the no-do gap, K-N-O-W, which is we look for areas in healthcare where we know that a certain best practice leads to the best outcomes, yet for some reason, we're not using those best practices in certain places. Uh, it's not always education. It's not always resources. It can be any number of factors, sometimes a combination of them. So what we try to do is take a scientific approach to understanding what's causing the deviation, and then how do we create interventions to steer behavior back to what we think is the optimal that leads to the best possible care. And so the reason why this is obviously relevant in the genomic space uh, early on, actually, my career started in the Human Genome Project. I was a part of that uh, back in the WashU years uh, when I was in graduate school. Um, genomics has come a very long way in the last 30 years, and the Broad has pushed the boundary and so much of the discovery, interpretation, and application of this over the years. And now we're, we've been entering into the field of implementation. Uh, beyond specialty care, how do we start getting this in the hands of clinicians where they can actually use this in everyday care? And that's going to take a lot of concerted and specialized effort to figure out the best way of doing this at scale. And uh, obviously, there's been a lot of discussion around this about the future of the implementation. And it has to be also done in such a way that it continues to learn from the discovery that's happening. It can't be fixated on one time frame of what best practices were because every year it changes. And so how do we do this in a way that's kind of a learning and dynamic system that evolves with time? So at Ariadne Labs, you know, like I mentioned before, we focus on these implementation challenges. We specifically try to develop scalable solutions that dramatically improve delivery of healthcare at critical moments that save lives and reduce suffering. And as I mentioned before, that no-do gap, we believe that precision medicine, genomic medicine, obviously being the leading edge of that, is ready for that because um, it has revolutionized specialty care. It hasn't really made its way over to primary care and population health yet. And yet there are known and actionable markers that we're not consistently screening for. And so what we need to do is think about how do we start bridging that gap, getting these technologies and these, the, these uh, therapeutics and diagnostics and so on into the hands of general practitioners where they can become much more actionable and accessible at the level of population health. So with that, the program that we started was e effectively based on that premise to say, what we want to do is we want to improve population health equitably by creating innovations and solutions that lead to widespread integration of precision medicine in healthcare and everyday life. And I'm sure I don't have to explain to the people in this audience what the current medical uses of genetic testing are. Um, you know, there, you know, it's, it's undoubtedly that genetic medicine has revolutionized specialty care. As, as you know, rare diseases and fertility treatment and so on is indicated, oncology and so on. And there are tremendous emerging opportunities for genetic testing 
as we look forward from population health to screening, prevention, uh, better therapeutics, in some cases, cures altogether. But the main question that we ask at Ariadne and at Pre uh, Precision Population Health is, as these technologies evolve, how do we make sure that they are accessible and equitable and can, uh, can be reached by all lives everywhere? Because the paradigm that's changing now is to say, instead of specific moments where people need interventions, like in specialty care, how do we use this throughout a lifetime? where they could have broad application, as my second part of the presentation will focus on, is through newborn sequencing, where we can now use it for prevention and for optimizing health throughout an entire lifespan. So if we think about it from the perspective of just purely uh, kind of market adoption, you know, one could argue that the innovators and early adopters, the visionaries, have been specialty care, cancer, rare diseases, uh, fertility, and so on. And yet, if we think about the mainstream market, that's where you're going to get population health, primary care, and prevention. And that's ultimately the goal of this is, you know, let's, one thing is to treat your disease, another one is to try to avoid it entirely. And so that's obviously part of the vision of this, uh, this field that we all work in. And yet there's this chasm, you know, there's this gap there that either can influence whether your technologies are adopted altogether, in some cases not, if you have to spend a lot of time thinking about that last mile and how you get this into the hands of clinicians and health systems altogether. Um, and even if they're adopted, part of this is also saying, well, if on average it takes about 17 and a half years for new innovations to naturally diffuse in healthcare, how do we accelerate that? How do we cut short those 17 and a half years so that we can get these, these, these medicines and these technologies in the hands of clinicians far faster than that, learning from what was done in the specialty areas beforehand. And that's effectively what PPDH is. So invariably, when we work with health systems, um, you know, there are many that are leading edge of this, right? The Geisingers of the world and, and many others that are doing leading edge work on the implementation of newborn of, of sequencing in general in genomic medicine. Uh, but not all health systems or clinics have those resources, availability, um, and finances, and so on. And so many of them, there are early majority that are starting to ask, well, how do we get into genetic medicine? How do we get into preventive care? And um, in many cases, they don't know the answers to some of the implementation questions. In many cases, they don't even know the questions um, before they even get to the answers. And one of the things we find is that people are often overwhelmed by thinking that, well, if you're going to do genetic medicine, you need to, it's, it's binary. You need to do all or nothing of, uh, you know, all the genetic markers, uh, all the, you know, different, you know, panels that you can screen for, all the therapeutics. And the reality is, is that it's, it's variable by health system. But what we try to do is we try to approach it from a practicality standpoint, which is that there are um, gene disease validity uh, in a whole spectrum. There is variant pathogenicity, an entire spectrum there as well, and clinical actionability. What we try to do is condense down into uh, indication-based testing, go further down into preventive screening, so the things that are the most valid, pathogenic, and actionable. And even there, we might even condense it even further, depending on the population that the health system sees, generally speaking, or their or specific interests that they may have at the health system. And so what we do with these health systems is try to understand from the early stages of readiness all the way through implementation, pilots, and even scale up, what is the most pragmatic way of starting and then evolving the program such that they may learn, they may correct any deficiencies they may have, and then scale and build on that, uh, and especially be as dynamic as possible as the science changes. Because as we know, this has been spreading around the world uh, you know, the, the graph on the far right obviously shows countries fully painted in. But the reality is, is even if you look at the United States, uh, there's a lot of area that's gray. Um, a lot of health systems that aren't, you know, they don't have access to this technology. A lot of patients that could benefit from this that don't have access to it as well. And so although, you know, we applaud the health systems and the countries that are, you know, leading the charge in this, the question is, what about the rest? What about the community clinics in, in rural Iowa, or what about uh, countries that aren't even there yet? How do we think about getting this into a more generalizable way that's accessible across the entire world with uh, best practices simplified down to what anybody, any clinician might be able to do in a way that's accessible by any patient 
uh, regardless of where they are or their background. And the reason why we at Ariadne Labs took this on was because we do work on implementation uh, challenges across a number of different programs. And when we ran a thorough analysis on, uh, it was a, a, an editorial review on the status of precision medicine in primary care, we realized that some of the, or most of the large high level implementation challenges overlapped with many other areas in healthcare from primary care to palliative care um, and, and many other pro projects of which we work on. So this is just a list of all the various projects that Area Any Labs works on. Uh, you'll see ours, Precision Population Health, right there in the middle. And so when we saw the overlap of all the work that's necessary in precision medicine implementation at scale in health systems, and the overlap with all the work that we've been doing elsewhere, especially in serious illness care, which is our palliative care program, we realized that there are a lot of learnings from other areas that we could bring into this field uh, and, and to much success. I mean, we've had a lot of impact across the world, uh, people using our tools and, and benefiting from the work, open source work that we do as part of Harvard and Brigham Women Hospital. So that brings me to the International Consortium in Newborn Sequencing. Uh, this was something that we started last year. So originally, um, some principal investigators of eight different programs uh, from across the world came together. These are leading programs that uh, we were just having informal month and quarterly calls actually last year. And, uh, and then at the end of last year, we decided to formalize as a consortium and have monthly calls, which we actually have right now. And then the consortium itself has grown significantly to other projects across the world that we've discovered ever since. And, uh, and the consortium at this point is over 75 people. We, um, like I mentioned, we hold uh, monthly, monthly meetings the first Wednesday of every month. And, uh, and I welcome people interested in this field to, to participate. Just go to uh, iconseek.org, um, which I can share with you later on as well. The mission of the consortium is to inform the clinical and public health research and implementation of genomic screening in newborns through the harmonization and aggregation of scientific evidence and resources. As I mentioned before, having been a part of the Human Genome Project, they've kind of seen genomics evolve over the last couple of decades. And what we're trying to do is say, well, how do we learn from general genetics, how it evolved over the last two decades, and try to harmonize on this so that we can all work as a community, working together to progress the field together in a way that's responsible, um, resourceful, and, 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 uh, and safe. And so what we want to do is make sure that all the key players are there from across different disciplines, it's not just researchers, it's clinicians, it's industry, uh, it's ethics and, and philosophers and so on. We want to make sure that we have the difficult conversations early and we address challenges before they actually uh, manifest themselves. So as part of that objective in, in harmonizing, we, um, what we said was, well, if we're all together in the same room, how do we solve common challenges that are pre-competitive in a way that we can all benefit? There's no point in reinventing the wheel across all the different projects. And so we had a, a, a few meetings where we discussed what are the kind of challenges that we should be addressing as, as a union. And, uh, and this is just a small list that came up, you know, from gene selection, data sharing, protocols and consents, shared methodologies, common terminology. And, um, and what we found from there, <coughs> excuse me, was that uh, some of these all fall under the same umbrella, which we are broadly calling data sharing. If you're going to share data, you need to have common terminology. Part of the data sharing are protocols and consent forms, variant interpretation, gene selection. And so what we decided to do was to take, <coughs> excuse me, a startup approach to solving this. So instead of spending years and years of design work, we... Um, Excuse me for a second. We decided to start small with something that was doable and then iterate from there. So this is the team that's been working on this, Rose, Needy, Anna, and myself, over the period of really about a month or two to say, okay, where do we start and where do we go from here? And what we decided was, well, there are different um, levels of the work that needs to happen, different segments. Number one is, how do we come up with a shared environment where these all these experts can share ideas and communicate with each other? So we created a members only section for, for the consortium. And that's where we're storing things that are document sharing. So people sharing their protocols, 
people sharing consent forms, people sharing outcome metrics and so on. These are the kind of things that they can learn, learn from each other. But importantly, as there are new programs spawning all throughout the world, this could be a resource for them to see how the leading experts are doing it and how they might be able to learn from that as they design their own protocols and they write their own consent forms. And then from there, what we want to do is then start diving in deeper, working with a consortium to figure out what is the minimal viable data set, if you will, that everybody can agree we can share. Something that's responsible, it, it accounts for privacy and security and many other things that vary or are similar across countries and different districts. And so how do we start identifying what that minimal viable data set is? And then once we identify that and what people want to do with that data, then we can think about what the appropriate system is to capture that information and where it lives and all that. But right now, we're, what we're doing is compiling all these documents from across projects across the world, and then from there, trying to figure out what that minimal viable data set is, and then beyond that is to actually solve the problem itself. Nick, we need to just finish up. Uh, okay. Thanks. Finishing up in just... 10 seconds. So we hold a yearly conference. So the first one was at the Museum of Science last year in Boston, uh, which was a great success by all measures. And then we are hosting a conference in literally uh, a week and, and a half in London, October 5th and 6th. Um, ICONS 23, many experts across the world, actually all the programs are going to be there, uh, many members from NHS, CDC, and so on, and we welcome uh, anybody to join us, either virtually or in person, just go to ICONS23.org. And with that, I pass it back to you, Heidi. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks, Nick. It's only a nine-hour time difference. Oh. <laughs> so our next speaker is Bob Freemuth. Bob is Associate Professor of Biomedical Informatics, Associate Chair for Academic Affairs and Faculty Development, and Interim Chair of the Department of AI and Informatics at Mayo Clinic in Rochester. Um, he is also co-chair of the HL7 Clinical Genomics Workgroup and co-lead of the GA4GH Genomics Knowledge Standards Workstream. Thank you for that, Bob. <laughs> and we'll let you go. All right. Thank you, everybody. And thank you very much for the opportunity to speak with you here today. Uh, it is an honor and a privilege to be able to share the stage with such an impressive array of speakers this week. In my role at Mayo Clinic, I have been a member of several translational research networks, and I have had the opportunity to work on a lot of clinical implementation projects. And so as a result, I've seen a lot of sausage get made. Today, I'm going to try to use some of the experiences um, from those internal initiatives to illustrate gaps that might pertain to GA4GH as we think about where we're going in the future. Do I have to do something with the slides, or are they coming up? Oh, it's the mythical green button. Okay, got it. Thank you. All right. So I could not have asked for a better, um, better panelist immediately prior. Nick, I think Nick sounds better with COVID than I do normally. But his talk about having genomic data from essentially birth uh, is what drives a lot of what I do and a lot of what I think about. So I think that's a, a great lead in here. So for those that have looked at the agenda for the GKS Connect sessions, you may have noticed that they have been themed. And so the subtitle for this talk is There and Back Again, because one of the major goals of my research program is to seamlessly cross this somewhat artificial divide between clinic and research. So Mayo Clinic has had a long history of genomic, uh, using genomic data to inform patient care. We started one of the first pharmacogenomic CDS programs and implemented our first CDS rule back in 2013, which I noticed was the same year this organization was founded. This slide shows a summary of the initial results from the right 10 case study, and I'm not going to go into the detail here, but it was 10,000 patients. It was 77 pharmacogenomics genes preemptive sequencing placed into the EHR and tied to CDS rules. When a provider was ordering a medication that might um, require some additional consideration given the patient's PGX profile, an alert would pop up and that profile would get some information about how they might handle that particular situation. Now from this study, we learned a lot of things. This was one of the first, at that point, large implementations that we did at Mayo. We learned what was required to get clinicians on board. We learned who they would call as their first point of contact when they had questions. 
That was the pharmacist, by the way. We engaged with participants and learned all about how they felt about receiving their genomic data. And we discovered all of those technology hurdles that had to be overcome in order to get the data into the EHR in a way that could drive those CDS rules. And then we learned later why some of the decisions we made in order to do that were impacted by changes in knowledge downstream. So in particular, in this particular study, we learned that the way the data was brought in was coupled very tightly. The format of the data was coupled very tightly to the logic in the CDS rule, and that made that a little bit fragile. And so this tight coupling made it difficult to scale that program, and it made it difficult for us to keep up with advances in knowledge. So one of the take home points here is that structured data is important, structured knowledge is important, and designing systems to elegantly handle changes in either is also important, but that's the tricky part. I'm going to move now to fast forwarding about 10 years into the future from when that study took place. About 2020, Mayo Clinic Center for Individualized Medicine launched the Tapestry Program. And in that study, we had a goal of recruiting and sequencing 100,000 patients. This was an exome test. I'm proud to say that although I'm not directly involved in this study, um, from the recruitment standpoint, our recruiters have been awesome. We are going to not only meet but exceed that this year. And we've already returned results to more than 78,000 patients. This slide gives you an idea about how we are using the data clinically as preventative tools to help manage these patients. I'm not going to go through this list here, but I do want to clarify the bottom point. The bottom bullet here is because the specimens for this study were collected by the participants at home, there is a break in the clinical chain of custody of that specimen. And therefore, even though these data were generated in a CAPCLIA lab and signed out by a, a lab director, they are treated as research results. And so that puts this into the research bucket for us when we're thinking about actionable findings and how we should treat those. In this case, uh, confirmatory sequencing is required. So this slide summarizes uh, some of the details about what we did as part of that study. I'm not going to go into this other than to simply mention we're returning the CDC1, uh, CDC tier one genes. We're loading the results into the EHR. Initially, we started loading the PDF of the report so the provider could take a look at that. We are now in progress of loading discrete results and I'll get into that in a little bit uh, in just a moment. Those results are based on a custom JSON format, which um, unfortunately, Larry, I am not going to show. <laughs> he begged me to show some JSON. So as Mayo has invested more and more deeply into genomic medicine, our approaches have progressed from this traditional indication-based testing to preemptive testing to now predictive and preventive testing. And so we're rapidly moving towards this future that Nick described, where every patient walking through the door has a whole genome sequence with them. And we need to learn from studies like Wright and Tapestry about what we can do to help prepare for and enable that future state. One of the things that we learned, this is the only JSON you'll see, one of the only things that we've learned is that every test, or nearly every test, is unique. What I showed you here were just two projects from our portfolio, and they each use different methods for conveying data from the testing lab back into the EHR. And what we've learned, and this probably won't come to, as a surprise to anyone that's worked in a clinical lab, there is tremendous heterogeneity in how tests are built, how data is represented, and how those results are then transmitted. All of this variability makes it incredibly difficult to ingest consistent and computable data within clinical systems at scale while avoiding those one-off implementation efforts. In fact, it's almost like we need a standard. <laughs> the question, of course, is which one? Because there are so many to choose from. So until we reach a time where there is massive convergence onto a single standard specification and everyone implements it the same way, we're faced with a scenario where there seems like there are limitless combinations of point-to-point -point connections and there's always going to be this little bit of a gap. 
So anybody that knows me knows that I'm a big advocate for standards, and I've now got the t-shirt to prove it. I have learned, however, that no matter how loudly I can advocate for standards, and how obvious those benefits of adopting standards might be, sometimes it is not possible to implement standards in all cases. And so the title of this panel is about bridging the gap, and so I thought it was important to identify some of the gaps that are listed here. I'm not going to go through all of these, but perhaps the most common barrier that I have seen is when situations occur where the project team does not control all of the decision-making authority over the systems it has to use to exchange data. This is almost always the case, and it almost always means that any solution for that particular project sharing data is a partial implementation of a standard at best. And therefore, we still need, and we may always need, an ability to bridge the gaps that remain. And so how do we make this connection? We have a situation where we need to send genomic results from one system to another, but they don't quite speak the same language. Now, we can force one system to change and fit the other, but unless both are controlled by the same authority, that is not likely and it's not terribly scalable. We can develop a common standard that both conform to, that of course I think would be the ideal situation, but um, it is a long-term solution. And then of course the third option is to use an adapter. That of course is a very common approach and it can be a one-off data load or it can be something more permanent. At Mayo, we're taking all three of these approaches. I'm only going to talk about or touch on the last two here, about how we're advocating for standards and how we are um, then developing these shims that live between. And of course, our hope is that the shim that we develop gets smaller and smaller over time as those two ends come together. So I won't go through all of the bullets on this slide. I will simply say that there are a variety of requirements for both the research and the clinical domains when it comes to sharing genomic data, and none of this will surprise anybody in this room. The common requirements are down at the bottom, and of course the goal here would be to define a single standard, a single method of representing genomic data so that we can use it equally well in either of these scenarios. So, spoiler alert, I'm jumping to the end. GA4GH and HL7 as organizations have complementary and overlapping areas of interest. I want the best of both. And so, I want to take the GKS data structures that we're developing, which are computable and unambiguous and normalized, and I want to use them within clinical messages. And so, that is what we've been trying to do. So, we've taken the core model from the VR spec in GKS, and we have worked it into the FIRE framework. And then we've extended a little bit to provide some additional clinical context. I think we're about 90% or so of the way there on alignment here, but of course there are some gaps on both sides, differences in scope, data type constraints, that sort of thing. But conceptually, I think we're moving in the right direction. And of course, the benefits of doing this is to enable data from knowledge bases that are using GA4GH representations to be used more seamlessly in clinical practice and conversely transmit clinical data back into the research space. So I'm going to go very quickly through this slide, all of the bullets. Um, the idea here is that we have a positive trajectory but we need a solution now. and so. The ideal approach to that long-term vision, that adoption, development and adoption of a, con of a common standard is certainly on the radar, but what do we do today? And what we're doing today is creating that converter box. So at Mayo Clinic, to help some of the genomic medicine programs, we are developing this converter box, and we call it CORE. CORE is the Clinical Omics Results Exchange. This is not a one-off solution. It is not a one-off data load with an ETL process. It is something that we have designed to be configurable as an ingest engine that is standard aligned. I can't stay standard conformant or standards based because those standards are still under development. 
but it is standard aligned and it is designed to meet data in the state that it is in today and provide us with tools that we can use to transform it and upgrade it into more robust forms over time. Now this is built on and based on part of our larger enterprise omics data platform, the ODP, and I don't have time today to go through um, all of the, the technical details, but hopefully you get the idea. I apologize, the arrows seem to have gotten a little bit carried away on this slide, but the idea <laughs> is that we're using this to now support the tapestry program. So we've got 100,000 exome tests with, um, uh, that are coming in through the tapestry program, and what we're doing is we're running them through uh, core to transform that project-specific JSON file that we're getting from the tapestry team into something that we can then transform into HL7 messages that speak the language of our EHR, and we can flow data from the project side into the EHR. I will go very quickly through this because I see the timer is counting down. We did a POC on core in 2022. We're due for our first production release this fall. So we're just finishing up the testing right now. Uh, we have version two in planning uh, for the future. Uh, we have the potential here to support thousands of tests and that's not an exaggeration because the Mayo labs alone have nearly that many or just over that many actually and dozens of systems beyond the EHR messaging function that I just referred to. So obviously this is a bit of an experiment. We'll assess the scalability and how it all works, but we're moving in this direction. And so in summary here, and I'll build through these uh, fairly quickly, obviously we're all building this airplane as we're flying it. The standards are under development, the field is moving, moving fast, and developing those robust standards does take some time, especially when we're trying to harmonize across governing bodies and organizations. Encouraging convergence is obviously a good thing. Uh, many things still remain out of our control. I won't go through all of that, but would be happy to talk about that further. No matter how good of a job here we do in GA4GH, there may always be a little bit around the edge that we need to make a decision about what to do with. And it is those gaps that hopefully keep getting smaller and smaller over time that we will have to find a way to fill. And then finally, GA4GH, of course, lives in a global environment in the uh, technical ecosystem that we all work, live and work in, both present a lot of challenges but also opportunities. And it is very exciting to see where we as an organization go next. So with that, I thank you very much. I, there was no way I could put everyone's name on this slide unless it was in about two-point font. So I am incorporating by reference everybody who has worked on these projects, um, thanking especially all the contributors uh, within GA4GH and HL7 who have helped to duct tape those two standards together. My colleagues in the Mayo Clinic SIM uh, and my team on the, the CGAT team who has done so much of the hard uh, work behind the scenes, and then NHGRI for funding um, much of the effort that you've seen here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bob. Um, so just a reminder that you can put questions uh, for Bob or Nick, and Nick will be participating in the panel discussion uh, as well virtually, uh, and you can put them into Slido. Um, but before we get to the discussion section, we have one more speaker. Uh, it's a pleasure to introduce Marcella uh, Sicchioli, who is a professor of genetics at the National Univer uh, University of Rosario and a specialist in medical molecular biology from University of Buenos Aires Faculty of Pharmacy and Biochemistry. She's a member of the Pan American Inherited Retinal Dy Dystrophies Group that spans the US and Latin America, and chair of the Association of Parents of Children with Stargardt Disease, Retina Argentina. Uh, and she's also a founding member of the Argentine Federation of Rare Diseases. <laughs> ah, I, I'm skipping one more. She has played a pivotal role in coordinating access to advanced therapies for patients in Argentina. Uh, Marcela, thank you. Well, in the first, um, I, I am so great, it, uh, grateful to, to be here, to the invitation of organizer to be here. Uh, my English is awful, 
then I, I will do my better. Um, what is this? Okay. Well, uh, I am a president of a patient association uh, of a patient with IRDs. Uh, I am a biologist and molecular biologist, but my daughter uh, has um, uh, in, inherited retinal dystrophies. Then it's a, a fight of my life, uh, this, this problem. Then uh, it's important for me to, to um, understand the actors with this film. The patient association, researchers, and ophthalmologists, government, industry, all of actors may um, articulate um, in, uh, um, between them because it's impossible to reach to the cure. We, we don't have cure or treatment for inherited retinal dystrophies. Uh, only one of uh, this um, pathology has uh, a gene therapy with a high cost. Then it's so important to to put in, in, in uh, uh, on the on the table all possibilities with other uh, pathologies. Um, thinking as the government, um, we are 46 million of patients of, of patients of persons in Argentina. 10.2 has disability. 25 of that um, persons have visual disabilities in uh, this um, uh, common. Um, uh, inherited retinal dystrophies are 31,000 patients. Uh, we, um, uh, as patients, uh, our voice uh, was here in this moment in 2011 uh, when, when we promote the law of care of patients with rare diseases in Argentina uh, through the Federation of uh, Argentine Patients of uh, Rare Diseases. Um, uh, and we have this law, the, the Convention of Right of uh, Human Rights uh, for Persons with Disabilities, and the, uh, finally, the resolution of <laughs> the General Assembly of United uh, Nations of, uh, for um, rare diseases of December of 2021 as the legal uh, compromise to, to attend uh, this kind of patient. Uh, inherited retinal dystrophies are uh, uh, lead to the to legal blindness or uh, complete blindness, and uh, are responsible of the um, the major cause of legal blindness uh, between 15 to uh, 45 years old. Then they have a huge impact of the quality of life because uh, uh, the impact is uh, during school, during the, age, the laboral age, then um, have a huge impact, uh, impact in the health cost. Um, the important um, loss of income uh, for patients who lost their love, uh, their, their job, uh, high emotional and economic costs due to the continuous study because it's so difficult to reach the correct diagnosis, clinical diagnosis. <laughs> the, obviously, the genetic diagnosis is, is uh, the worst worsening the clinical state because uh, the uh, inappropriate or uh, wrong um, um, uh, therapies. And obviously, without the um, diagnosis, it's absolutely impossible to, to be candidate or any, any possible, possible clinical trial or uh, treatment. This is a beautiful image of the retina. Uh, all the layers is a beautiful picture of uh, Dr. Um, Nicolás Cuenca of uh, Alicante, of University of Alicante, and uh, the text is of uh, Professor um, Carlos Mendoza of the University of Florida. 
uh, uh, represent uh, uh, different layers, are, have different cells and different genes uh, impact in different cells, and all of them as a, a little, uh, a little most of uh, a little sample of the pathologies uh, of in, in uh, which impact in uh, in any layer. Obviously, we have thinking a geneticist and biology is a great <laughs> problem because we have a great overlap of phenotype uh, and of genotype. The same gene could uh, lead to five of six different pathologies and nine, uh, 90 genes could um, determine for example, retinitis pigmentosa, the, 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 the same phenotype, but <laughs> different genes cause this, this pathology. This problem is absolutely worse in pediatrician, uh, um, in, in, in pediatric uh, children, because um, they have, uh, they don't have all of the characteristics. Then it's so difficult to to determine the prognosis in in children. Uh, obviously, is uh, the same gene uh, could lead to syndromic pathology and non-syndromic pathology <laughs> is a great a, a great uh, the burden to to, uh, the, to attend this population obviously uh, any uh, genetic pathology hereditary pathology um, uh, determinate negative and emotional burden sigma guilt in parents uh, in every in, in every family in all the families sigma um, the fear of the future, search of meaning, uh, anxiety, depression, loss of family and, relation, and, uh, and social relationship, and the correct um, counseling uh, could uh, mitigate the negative feelings of this of this possibility. But obviously, this uh, because the the odyssey of the diagnostic is really really difficult to to transit. Uh, obviously, the genetic test uh, uh, allowed to, to obtain the diagnosis, uh, not, in on, not in all the cases, but in a lot of cases, and then it's so important to, to achieve this. We, uh, I belong, uh, I, um, I am Argentina, in Argentina, the genetic test is not covered for the uh, health system. Then it's a lot, it's, it's really difficult to achieve the, the genetic tests. Well, thinking as a patient association, uh, the absolutely agreement, the LC compliance, ethical, legal, and social issue, we, uh, what um, we think and uh, in what way we can um, collaborate with researchers to achieve the, uh, the cure we need for our patient, my, my daughter, <laughs> between them. Uh, developing the data, the, our database uh, was the, the, the first um, step in this, in this way. Then we uh, begin to, to take uh, data of our patient, all, all of them in the mark of the uh, patient association. Uh, we are not a hospital, we are not <laughs> a university. We are university, uh, universitarians um, um, uh, members, but uh, we are patient association. Uh, we, we have a database registered at the Ministry of Justice with, uh, the, with clinical records, anamnesis studies, and obviously with the correct informed consent uh, the, to include all the uh, clinical history and the molecular diagnosis when the molecular diagnosis exists. Uh, obviously, we agree absolutely with the uh, personal data law uh, protection law. Uh, then uh, we, we can uh, take all of the data uh, in, in, in this form. Um, 
since 10 years este, ago, already in Argentina, este, began to develop the genetic diagnostic in Argentina for patients. Not only in Argentina, but <laughs> for patients of Argentina. Um, the primary challenge is obviously in center person uh, the in center in person diagnosis because we agree absolutely to the human right to the, conven the convention of human right of the person with disability then this means uh, to obtain the precision uh, diagnosis and appropriate uh, counsel counseling and explain according the the language the peop, the kind of people the level of instruction uh, the, all the significant all the meanings of the, uh, the genetic test um, the second uh, challenge is obviously the f the benefit of science of the society to uh, the in increase the knowledge about our pathologies. Uh, we have um, we instrument different kinds of uh, project to to sequencing. One of the project was articulate with the government. We uh, <laughs> we reach uh, they they pay <laughs> 50 patients of a Sarga disease. We pay another 60, 50 patients, and then we have the first uh, 100 patient uh, sequencing of the Sarga disease. Uh, it's a one one approach one project. Uh, the, the other project was uh, through different sponsors. I uh, think any, anything about this. I, I say anything about this, and uh, we have an agree with the De Beijing of uh, University of Barcelona is a um, center of the reference in uh, um, retinal dystrophies. Uh, of Europe, uh, with a lot of experience, we have a great, great este, rendimiento, que no me acuerdo como se dice en inglés. Mónica Gil, <laughs> thank you. Gil, este, este, with a lot of uh, a higher grade. Um, when um, uh, we have sponsors in pharma uh, for, for take a genetic test, but they haven't any data of our patients. It's absolutely anonymized the, te the test with our patients. Uh, we don't uh, interchange absolutely uh, any data personal and genetic data pers uh, personal of uh, our patients. We need to articulate in this form because we need to achieve the, the test and uh, the, our, uh, our population can't uh, pay the test. Then we have at, at now more than uh, 1,000 patients with, with ARDs sequencing and correctly informed. 50% uh, of that uh, population uh, sequencing is, uh, uh, was for free. Uh, the, and obviously we uh, really uh, care, uh, have a, a lot of care of the dates. Um, one important data about this is in the in 300 um, genes we have in, in genital retinal dystrophies, uh, almost 40 percent are uh, the novel that novel variants. They are not, they aren't at the, uh, the classical uh, database. Then it's so important include uh, this uh, the, uh, our variants. Uh, at the pan genome, <laughs> the, or uh, the, the, uh, the, the genome uh, about our population. Um, we have different programs. Uh, I, I um, um, speak about three pro different programs, uh, sum uh, a summary of the uh, little programs. We have um, general programs which include ophthalmologists and geneticists with all of America. 
Este, this um, program is uh, the PANIRD program. PANIRD is Pan American uh, Inherital Retinal Dystrophy Group. We include professionals of United States, Mexico, Colombia, Argentina, Chile, well, all of this in the in the in the slide. Uh, we um, we have uh, we hold open admittance with academic activities only Monday uh, since um, October uh, uh, 2019. Uh, 20, uh, 2019. Uh, then is uh, we we could ask um, con different consult about. Uh, the cases of uh, different ophthalmologists in all the corners of Latin America and Caribbean uh, to, uh, to collaborate uh, with them to uh, resolve the phenotype of the patients and when, when it's possible, uh, with the, the genetic test. Um, this program uh, includes uh, uh, a Panir Beca, and we began last year with a PhD in the uh, Catholic University um, of uh, Genetic Ocular uh, the, um, uh, PhD because our ophthalmologists don't, uh, are, uh, don't, don't uh, know uh, anything of genetics. Uh, it's a defect of deformation. Well, um, the, the, I was thinking about the, the bring the, the gap in patients, we have obviously activities with our patient uh, with uh, continuous education of the patient. One of the possibility is an annual meeting of patients and families, and then we uh, talk about different clinical trials, etc. Uh, in 2018, I know my time is <laughs> horrible, but I can speak <laughs> fast. Uh, the, then, identify, uh, then we identified a clinical trial in China for patients we have in our database. Uh, we, have, um, uh, we, we read all the literature, but the interesting of this project was to, to take into account the possibility was Ministry of Science um, um, through Fabiana Arzuaga, which is part of the GA for GI, GH, uh, the, the, um, she leads to three commissions, one of the patient, Redapta, a Patients Association for Advanced Therapy, and uh, the commission of experts in, in that um, uh, advanced therapy, stem cells, um, gene therapy, and others. Then we, we uh, ask for the, that, that commission of experts uh, their opinion about our patient could participate of that, uh, the, of that clinical trial in phase three. When they said yes, it, it was possible, well, it was <laughs> imagined uh, to, to travel from Argentina to China. <laughs> uh, the, well, um, in this moment, we uh, take uh, contact with patient and with a researcher when we uh, uh, achieve the, the possibility of patient uh, travel to China. Um, we train in all patient and family to attend especially consent, informed consent uh, with the prop uh, our proper, proper interpreter. Well, uh, the, the, the therapy was uh, perfect, uh, really. I don't know because why the video are not <laughs> here, but it's not important. But uh, the, the boy with the black, white cane is uh, in the video, with, uh, which not is in the <laughs> slide, is reading his bicycle after therapy and uh, other is uh, playing ping pong. <laughs> really, the, the therapy works. Well, ahí está, estaba ahí. Bueno, no importa, <laughs> no importa. Other 
uh, is, is the, is the uh, last or one, one more. Uh, the other problem is when the te therapy is approved, the high cost is absolutely impossible for us. Then all of our support for patients for Luxurna, the first uh, therapy for uh, the inherited retinal dystrophy approved is um, 800.000, ¿cómo sería? Uh, the 800,000 of dollars. It's absolutely impossible for us. Then it, it was so important to, uh, the, we have uh, just three patients applied in Argentina. This is the last. <laughs> uh, this is an important th uh, th issue for the bridging the gap between the, the research and the clinical care. Uh, if we can uh, read the, the, the slide, um, we have more than 60 patients applied it in North America and only seven patients applied in all Latin America and Caribbean. And the cost is the problem, yes? Because we have the patient identified. Then it's so important the voice of the patient to participate in all the, in the uh, and articulate all the uh, actors in this, in this film. The balance in different actors is so important to reach to the cure and to, uh, the, and to the treatment uh, in, in our pathology. Thank you so much. Uh, apologize by me horrible in English and to be continued. Thank you. <laughs> No, it's Monica, great. <laughs> I need to slide you. Okay, great. Um, so uh, we're going to do. A f uh, we're going to go over just ten minutes into the lunch uh, session since we got started a little late, um, and I'll try to divide up some of the questions. So, Marcella, do you ever find any challenges navigating between being a bi biologist and an advocate? Well, um, um, when we have a, a, a daughter, in, in my case, a, a daughter uh, with uh, this pathology, I, I was a geneticist before. <laughs> <laughs> my my children. Then, uh, obviously, uh, it's uh, it's natural to uh, to to um, uh, to go forward uh, uh, the in the interest in the, the to to resolve the situation. Then, uh, the advocacy is absolutely uh, necessary. Uh, is the um, is the wake um, part of the of the the puzzle, and then is uh, where we we can uh, do the best work. Um, we we are translator between uh, science and patients, uh, and this is a really uh, an important uh, an important issue. Great, thanks. Um, a question from Tiff. Bob, sorry, not a standards question. I was interested that self-correction of a specimen renders the test ineligible for clinically accredited reporting. Are there clinical circumstances, such as reproductive carrier testing, in which you think self-collection would be deemed acceptable? That's a very interesting question, and I am not the right person to answer it because I'm not a clinician. But, um, Heidi. I, we use self-collected specimens all the time in the clinical testing industry. It's, I'm actually surprised that that is a reason because it's, uh, spit collection is commonly used in lots of testing. So we should talk and figure this out. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, I actually, there aren't questions for Nick, but I have one of my own, which I also think will have, um, I'd love to hear Marcella's perspective here on this. So Nick, um, the benefit of newborn screening uh, is for intervention, yet many low and middle income countries have no funded healthcare to actually intervene when you diagnose 
a patient with a newborn through newborn screening. And I wonder if you could comment on thinking about the challenges of rolling out newborn screening uh, without carefully thinking through ensuring access to the interventions necessary. And I, after Nick responds, Marcella, I would love to hear your perspectives in Argentina and how you think about newborn screening and the ability to offer you know, individuals in your country access. Uh, Nick, can you hear that question? I did hear that. Thank you, Heidi. Uh, yeah, that's actually an interesting question. We we spent a little time thinking about that. We're actually in the middle of potentially designing a project specifically around that, which is how do we expand screening potentially with sequencing uh, to other countries, LMIC. Um, and one of the key things there that we identified was obviously to say, well, what is the minimal set of things that you can screen for that different countries would have access to interventions? And by access, not only that they exist there, but they're also affordable and, and are potentially covered by their health systems. And so I don't think there's an easy answer for that. I think it's going to vary tremendously by country, uh, but I think it's an open question and what, one which is part of the design phase right now in a project that we're looking into. Uh, we're in the early phases, but that's exactly the question that we're asking as well. Great. And Marcella? Uh, in Argentina, we have a newborn screen uh, standard, absolutely standard. In this moment, the Federation of, uh, of Patients, FADEPOF, uh, we, I said, um, don't, I don't say rare, rare disease uh, in Spanish because uh, for us, rare uh, is, uh, means strange. Then, uh, we uh, we we use um, low frequency, no, uh, because that the federation is uh, Fadepov, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but uh, and non feder as in Spain and it's in Spain. Uh, we have uh, in this moment uh, a great fight uh, uh, of uh, any um, uh, great part of the of our association in the federation because uh, all um, a lot of uh, a lot of association are fighting especially to include different or so add other um, pathologies at the newborn screening because really it's absolutely necessary to to take uh, to take this information in advance uh, in inherited retinal dystrophy uh, is is uh, is not possible mm -hmm. uh, until now but probably <laughs> in near future Great. But other, other, uh, they are, must be included. Great, thank you, and thanks for that uh, information about the use of the word rare in different countries. Just shows you how important it is to think about other perspectives from other countries. Um, Bob, is there a vision for ongoing patient clinical information from EHRs to be linked back to the genomic data through CORE? And so, I, unfortunately, I didn't have time to get into the architecture very deeply, and I, I hope it wasn't too confusing what I did try to blow through fairly quickly during the talk. CORE is intended to be a piece of middleware that sits between our genomic data warehouses and our EHR systems, and so there is a fully identified link between those two things. The system itself, I'm just looking down at Andrew's question as well, the system itself is more than a translation engine, so it's doing more than the syntactic translation. We're also using that as a platform to start looking at um, enriching and upgrading our data so that there will be uh, lab-validated transformations taking values that come in from genetic tests regardless of where those tests might come from. So hundreds of tests hit our servers every day. Um, taking those values and uh, normalizing them as they come in. Thanks, Bob. And Marcella, I wanted to ask you, you sh showed a really wonderful um, translation from basic research all the way to, to clinical translation. Does the model that you have embraced for the retinal Ar Ar Argentina work for all rare diseases? Do you see that as a template for other, um, other diseases? And yeah. uh, yes. Uh, we. Um, well, not not only association have a biologist <laughs> yeah. into his association, but uh, this could could see an advantage because we have a different uh, strategic vision. But um, I I work uh, 
uh, hardly with other associations uh, into the, the federation. And we have, uh, we, we are in, um, uh, trying to, to, uh, to, to copy this, uh, this model to, to, to work in a, to other pathology, mm -hmm. rare pathologies. Uh, yes, it's a, it's, a, it's a work in this moment. <laughs> Great, excellent. Um, Bob, are there aspects to CORE that distinguish the transforms that it can do versus what that which can be done with other generic integration engines such as MIRTH? Does it provide specialist genomic services to aid the transform engine? Yeah, so Andrew, we should talk maybe a little bit afterwards. So this is uh, where I was saying it goes beyond um, some of the transformations that might be applied here, and we're starting to think about using this as a way of building in additional um, data management uh, routines that are clinically validated uh, over time. So if that's something you have um, experience with, with Mirth, I'd love to hear more from you about, um, about how that could potentially be built in. Great, and we'll pass the last question to you as well. Does the CDM of OMOP fit into your platform plans? This is definitely a GA4GH. We got a lot of acronyms. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, and you want to define CDM and OMOP by while you're. I would be happy to, and I'll <laughs> probably use some more in the process, so I apologize. So uh, Mayo Clinic, big picture, Mayo Clinic has a platform, an enterprise platform that brings together all of our enterprise systems. Included in that is our EHR, and included in that is our omics data platform, our ODP that I presented on. So all of that's part of this big picture. The core component that I was referring to here is part of all of that. Now from that platform, we do have instances of OMOP, sorry, CDM is common data model. OMOP is another standard for outcomes. The um, uh, OMOP is supported at Mayo. It's not our primary uh, storage location, however. So if, if we needed to go into OMOP, we would push to it from our platform as opposed to use that as the primary source of truth. Great. And with that, I know you're all hungry, so I'm going to let you go off to lunch. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you.